Good evening. I'm calling to order the meeting of the Arlington Select Board for Monday, October 25th, 2021. This is Select Board Chair Steve DeCourcy. Permit me to confirm that all members and persons anticipated on the agenda are present and can hear me. Members, when I call your name, please respond in the affirmative. Diane Mahan? Affirmative. John Hurd? Yes. Len Diggins? Yes. Eric Helmuth? Yes. Staff, when I call your name, please respond in the affirmative. Adam Chapdelaine? Yes. Doug Heim? Yes. And Board Administrator Ashley Marr is participating remotely. Tonight's meeting of the Arlington Select Board is being conducted remotely consistent with an act signed into law on June 16th, 2021 that extends certain COVID-19 measures adopted during the state of emergency. The act includes an extension until April 1, 2022 of the remote meeting provisions of Governor Baker's March 12th, 2020 executive order suspending certain provisions of the open meeting law. The governor's order, which is referenced with agenda materials on the town's website for this meeting, allows public bodies to meet entirely remotely so long as reasonable public access is afforded so that the public can follow along with the deliberations of the meeting. Before we begin, permit me to offer a few notes. First, this meeting is being conducted by Zoom, is being recorded, and is also being simultaneously broadcast on ACMI. Persons wishing to join the meeting by Zoom may find information on how to do so on the town's website. Persons participating by Zoom are reminded that they may be visible to others and that if you wish to participate, you are asked to provide your full name in the, in the interest of developing a record of the meeting. All participants are advised that people may be listening who do not provide comment and those persons are not required to identify themselves. Both Zoom participants and persons watching on ACMI can follow the posted agenda materials also found on the town's website using the Novus agenda platform. Finally, each vote tonight will be taken by roll call. Uh, before we begin with the uh, item number two, agenda item number two, I would like to ask the board uh, for a moment of silence for Jane Marie Hillier. Um, Jane Marie Hillier served on the Board of Selectmen from 1985 to 1991. She also was chair of the Library Trustees of Arlington, and she was a teacher for over 50 years. Uh, she passed away on October 16th, 2021. So with the board's indulgence, I'd like to ask for a moment of silence um, in Mrs. Hillier's memory. Thank you very much. Moving to item two, honoring Joseph A. Curo. I believe Mr. Curo is with us tonight. Good evening, Mr. Curo. Hello there. How are nice you? Nice to see you. Nice to see you all. Great. So I, I'm going to say a couple words, then turn it over to board members for a couple words, and then, and then um, whatever you want to say to the public and to the board, we'd uh, love to hear from you. But it's it's great to finally have you back to honor you for your service to the board. It's it's a little late in coming, so I apologize. Um, and we had hoped to do it in the chambers, but that's just not going to be possible. Um, Joe Caro, as, as most of you know, served on the um, select board from 2012 to 2021. He was one of the rare members of the select board who also served on the school committee, serving from 2008 through 2012. He was a member of the Human Rights Commission from 2006 to 2008. He's been a town meeting member consecutively since 2003. Um, and you also want to point out for every one of the committees that Joe served on, at one time or another, he served as, as chair. So he's had a a giant impact on the town over the past 20 years. It was a fantastic colleague and still continues to do great work in the town of Arlington. I'm really pleased that we're finally able to, to honor you tonight, Joe. So what I'm gonna do is ask members for comments and then uh, turn it over to you. And I'll start with Mr. Diggins. You started with me. Wow, so uh, Mr. Kiro, let's see. Remember this, do you see it? 
I sure do. <laughs> so, so he, he, yeah, I was doing sound check feed and, and, and you took that pick and, and apparently when I decided to run for a town meeting, some people thought, well, it's where this pick come from. And you had to tell them that, that you took it, you know, so clearly you've had a big effect on me, you know, uh, uh, but even before me, uh, you and others planted the notion of me running for select board uh, in my mind. I mean, it was just always a joy I mean, uh, coming, you know, to, uh, working, you know, the, the select board meetings for ACMI because I mean, you were there from the start, I mean, at least from when I started working, the shows, I mean, uh, and, and you were always such a warm and friendly person. I mean, and, and even when I, you know, began to have a sense of how you were gonna vote, I was always interested in what you were going to say it, uh, uh, because it, it, I knew I was going to learn something and you had such a great way of phrasing things. And I'll never forget that um, it was a meeting uh, back in 2017 uh, towards the end of the year when uh, you were reading the statement as to whether you were going to run again because no, no one really knew. And that was quite the letter. You know, it held us in suspense until the last sentence. It, and, and that's another thing that's really great about you is that you're just a wonderful writer. It, uh, uh, you, you have a great way with words being and, and, and uh, uh, well, words and paragraphs. Uh, and so, uh, Joe, you know, I could go on, uh, but, but if I do, we, then I won't be able to complain, you know, when the meeting goes until midnight. So I'm going to cut it short and let other people uh, have a, a word, but I will end by not only saying that I love you very much, and not only that, I, I like you, I like you a lot, but then I'll show you. Uh, so there you go. Take care. <laughs> Thank you, Len. Well, that's, that's Thank very you, kind. Mr. Diggins. Uh, Mr. Helmuth. Thank you, hello, my friend. Um, you probably don't remember this, but shortly after I moved to town, I wrote an email to you, you were on the school board at the time, out of the blue, I was very concerned about something. and you wrote back quickly, you wrote back from the heart, a, a lengthy message that spoke exactly my concerns. It was honest. You didn't pretend like you had all the answers. And I never forgot that. And everything I know of your public service through both of those terms and other things has been consistent with that. You have always made time for people. You have always loved the people of this town. You have always celebrated the accomplishments uh, particularly of artists and of people working for peace, justice, and equity, and so many other things. And um, you have been an inspiration to me in my public service and to so many and have showed us how it's done. So for that, I am grateful for our friendship. I am grateful and I'm glad that we had a chance to make you sit here and listen to this tonight. Thank you, Mr. Helmuth. Uh, Mr. Hurd. Thank you and welcome back, Mr. Carl. I, th I think we met, I can remember years and years back at, when you were run, first running for school committee and we sat in the corner and we bonded over the fact that we were both jumbos. And I always enjoy, I think we always had a little bit of pride that when we served together that, that we ha had multiple jumbos and, and uh, we had some good showing on the Arlington Select Board. So it certainly, in no offense to anyone else's schools, but it, it is missed to have some jumbo pride along there with me. But I think one, one of the things that really stands out to me is we, of course, in, our, in my first election, were in the same cycle. And when you first found out that I was thinking about running, you immediately called me. We went, had coffee at Cafe Nero. And even then, when you knew that we were going to be, quote unquote, opponents in the election, you offered advice to me. You were always trying to help me. And I think that carried through when I first became on the board. I turned to Joe for advice because I knew that Joe had a lot of experience in town, both on the school committee and the select board. And he was always a good, good person to, to look to for information. And uh, I think at one point when I first got on, I was trying to go to as many events as I could. And I was talking to somebody in town and they're like, oh, it's good to see you out and about. And I said, yeah, well, I'm trying to get out and, and be known. I'm not quite, I don't make it to as many events as Joe does. And whoever it was turned to me and said, oh, well, no one expects you to go to as many events as Joe Carl. 
because Joe Carl was at every town event. It could have been six nights a week, just because of your immense commitment <clears throat> to the town and the town issues. And I always really respected that about you, Joe. And um, it's certainly big shoes to fill both on the board from as a member of the select board, but also just in town who can uh, wear all the hats that you wore, whether it be leading the uh, Fox Parade or dressing up in full garb for the um, for Paul Revere to come by. I, I don't know if anybody on the select board so far has been able to to step up and, and take on that role, but we'll see. Maybe Mr. Hel Helmuth will, will, will take that on. But you are certainly missed on the board. I have a lot of respect for you, and I hope you're doing well. Thanks. Thank you, John. Thank you, Mr. Hurd. Mrs. Mahan. Thank you, Mr. Chair, and thank you for those remarks for our former colleague, Mrs. Cecilia. Joseph, um, sort of piggybacking on the um, comments my colleagues have made, uh, it always impressed me when you first got on, not only were you at every town event, um, far more than me, the amount of not only energy and commitment you had to um, take on so many subcommittee assignments, um, not only take them on, but you always gave a full report. Um, and that's pre-COVID when you had to travel all across um, the Commonwealth. Um, and you always brought, brought back the salient points instead of, you know, it's usually stuff we didn't know. And um, we got educated that way. So not, not only your participation, um, but the fact that you gathered the knowledge and could report back to us. I was definitely appreciative of that because um, I would feel a little bit guilty that um, traditionally I've been the select board member that's kind of lower on the subcommittee assignments. Um, and I'd like to say that if I could, I would have the energy to do as much as you did, but I don't think so. <laughs> um, the other thing that I'm missing so much um, is hearing you uh, talk about not only at the meetings, but pre-meeting and post uh, about your, your beautiful family, um, the vacations you take, um, who goes on the vacations, uh, the sites you've experienced. Um, and my favorite select board night um, was when you were chair all that year, you would, whenever I saw you say, pardon me folks, but I've written down some thoughts here that I'd like to share with you. I sat back and I truly enjoyed each and every one of them. They were so heartfelt, so filled with emotion. Um, and I literally, honestly hung on every word, uh, which sometimes that's hard. <laughs> um, so I, I definitely miss you. Um, um, the select board team for the spelling bee is gonna miss you. <laughs> I think we, no disrespect to at least the, the town manager or anyone else, but you definitely brought us up a grade um, and got us to the finals and whatever successes we had. Um, so we're going to miss that. Maybe we can still, you know, bring you in as the ringer. <laughs> but um, uh, all my love to you, to your wife, to your family. Um, and I wish you nothing but God's blessings, good health, and look forward to see what you do in the future. Thank you, Joe. Thank you so much, Diane. Appreciate Thank that. you, Mrs. Mahan. Um, and, and, and Joe, I, I spoke at the beginning. I just want to say a word or two on a, on a personal note before I, I, I turn it over to you. And, and as you know, you and I met years ago when I was on the Sims Advisory Committee and you would come to the meetings before you did join the Sims Neighborhood Advisory Committee. And uh, like so many people in town, you started because you were interested in, in something that was happening in your neighborhood. You got more and more involved and you came to those meetings and, and, and really brought something to the table at those meetings. You weren't a member, but you, you addressed the concerns and we all could see here's someone who's gonna do a lot of great things for the town. And sure enough, within a few years, you were on the school committee uh, during a very challenging time and then on the select board. And, and I, unfortunately, we only got to serve together for two years, but it was a great two years. And, and to, to what the other members have said, um, you and I would talk and you're always so thoughtful about different issues. And, and if a particular issue came up, sometimes you'd say, Steve, I think I'm gonna have to write something tonight. And we all were better for, for having you um, give the speeches, make the comments that, that were so important. 
And um, one one just uh, aside before I turn it over to you is very early on, I was told by Mr. Hurd um, when we were at town hall for the national anthem is don't stand so close to Mr. Hurd during the national anthem because you'll sound terrible next to him. Um, Joe has such a great singing voice. Oh. We we never really wanted to to interfere with that. And uh, Mrs. So Mahan does too. She just away. doesn't share it that much. But anyway, it's great to see you here tonight, and and we still see you around town. And and as you can see, all the members here, uh, we so appreciate everything that you've done for the community. And uh, the floor is yours now. Thank you very much. I'm, <laughs> this is uh, I, I know this will come as a surprise. I'm practically struck speechless. Um, uh, you're all <laughs> very kind. Um, a couple of you mentioned the written remarks, and I want to tell you that mercifully, I, I have not written out remarks, which that can go for better or for worse. It can uh, meander. Um, I want to start by saying that um, I, I was moved by, by uh, the moment of silence. Uh, for Mrs. Hillier. Um, I don't know if I actually ever met her, but I think that that serves as a real reminder when we are in the chamber or were in the chamber and we look to the back uh, of it and we see all of those photos of um, everyone who's come before us that, that we're, we're just building on on the accomplishments of of um, of those who have served on on the board before us and uh, we all have a, a temporary period of time um, to, to occupy the the, the seat and, and do our little little um, um, part um, I I, I want to say you know I think uh, as you all know I, um, I I did have to leave uh, two months early uh, rather um, abruptly and I want to just say here like publicly I want to thank you know all of the folks who reached out to me they, they were concerned that it might be health uh, health issues that that had precipitated that but I want to just assure you that it was a, another set of personal and professional considerations that I just had to focus on with eagle eye and and the time was uh, um, um, it would it, it paid off in the end uh, being able to have that time so I thank you for your indulgence and I I, I am sorry for uh, <laughs> having uh, hit the exits um, a little bit prematurely there um, I had a very wonderful visit today uh, from uh, Dan Warren at the Department of Public Works who uh, knocked on my door with a big box and I'm gonna see if if, if you can see this but he uh, he dropped off this this beautiful heirloom chair with my name and the seal of the town of Arlington and my uh, years of service uh, on the board. And I, I wanna thank you all for that. And I wanna thank um, you know, everyone who, who facilitated that. It's beautiful. And I wanna tell you, it's, it's the most, it's probably the most ergonomic chair in the house. And uh, that's important to me because I've been working at home for uh, over a year and a half now, so. Uh, <laughs> It's great to have something I can put my arms on and I can remember um, the, the time um, in the board. Um, I've known all of you for, for, for so long in, in various ways. I think, honestly, uh, Mrs. Mahan, I think that, uh, Diane, I think that you um, are probably the, the selectman that uh, I had the most uh, engaged in involvement with um, earliest on when you were coming up and, and working with our neighborhood. And uh, and and listening to some of the, the concerns back back during the Sims project, Mr. DeCourcy um, uh, referenced, um, and I feel I've known I've known Steve uh, almost, almost as long. Um, you always were of great counsel to me, uh, especially um, <clears throat> when I was on the on the school committee and and early years on on the select board. You know, you were serving as a member of the finance committee. Uh, you and Mr. Dunn. Um, really went against the wisdom that Mr. Tosti laid out at town meeting once saying that if you serve on the finance committee, you will never be elected to office ever. And uh, you guys proved that wrong. Um, and, and that that council was always very, very important then. And, and I, was, I was happy to be able to serve with you um, as well. John, you expressed uh, our special bond that we, that, that we, um, that we have. Um, I've always appreciated your, your calm, cool, and collected uh, uh, approach to things. I mean, really uh, inserting um, some 
some levity in, into the, into our, our discussions. Um, I always appreciate running into you in Costco with your, 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 your boys and, <laughs> and the devotion that you show to them. I have two regrets as, as regards this, this current board, and it's that, um, number one, Mr. Diggins, even though we served almost a year, we never once sat in the select board chamber together. Um, so that, that picture you showed is just about the closest we had. And uh, I, I got a kick out of it when you told me that you, uh, um, ACMI would test the sound levels against my laugh. So <laughs> Um, and Eric, uh, I feel like I've served with you. <laughs> We've been involved in so many um, initiatives together and, and your leadership on the, on the uh, CPA committee and with electronic voting and town meeting. Um, I, I, I feel like this. So I, I, I am, I'm so happy to see you um, uh, occupying the, 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 the space that I, I vacated there. Um, um, so thank you. I'd be remiss if I didn't, you know, give a shout out to the other uh, four um, select board members with whom I served. Um, Dan Dunn, and, and I have to especially thank him for, for pinch hitting and coming in and filling in when, when I did have to step down a little bit early, uh, earlier in the year. Clarissa Rowe, who did that twice <laughs> um, at various times. Steve Byrne, with whom I was elected. And, and of course, um, probably the, the lowest moment of, of my time on the board was um, when, we, when we lost um, Kevin Greeley. Um, I will never forget that um, phone call. Um, <clears throat> also wanna thank our staff, uh, the select board staff, Ashley and Lauren, Marianne and Fran were there for most of the time. Um, when I first got on, Jean Berg was there and she's no longer with us anymore. Um, and always the rock, um, holding the whole operation together, uh, Marie Kropelka. So thank you, Marie. I love you. I have a feeling you had something to do with uh, making sure this chair happened. So uh, um, like you, you make so many other things happen. Um, you're you're, um, you're a, a facilitator beyond, uh, uh, beyond approach. So um, thank you. I, I, I love you all. And then I have to thank all of the, the um, professional staff. Adam, you, you've always had like extraordinary teams. Um, you always were extraordinary to work with. I appreciate it as, as board chair that you made the time for, for weekly, weekly sit downs and uh, were always so um, accessible and the people that you've uh, pulled together um, on your immediate team um, have always been um, phenomenal. And I think that's why Arlington is where, where we are today and why Everyone's always trying to steal you away from us. Um, and that team includes uh, our legal team. So uh, Doug, thank you. Your, your advice has been uh, most, um, most welcomed. I think I had a year or two with Juliana and, um, but it feels like you've been sitting there just about forever and it probably feels that way to you as, as, as well. Um, you know, this is just one part of the big, a big, uh, machine and uh, we have so many dedicated employees in this town of public safety, public works, libraries, planning, parks and rec, human resources, IT, et cetera, um, health and human services um, that, that really keep the town going and have especially kept it going over the last um, difficult uh, year, year and a half, almost, almost two years. Um, and we couldn't do anything uh, without the support of our residents. So at the risk of going a little bit too long, I was sitting back <clears throat> and I was thinking about the nine years that I was, I was on the board and trying to reflect back on what, what did we accomplish. And, and we is taken very seriously. As you all know, not a single thing that gets done is done by a single board member, anything big and meaningful and lasting done by a single board member. It's, it's done as a team working with the manager and, and, and his, um, his, his team. I think when I got on, we, it was the tail end of the Mass Ave corridor project. I think, uh, Diane, you're probably the last board member now who really felt that the scars of that um, early on, but uh, we, we, we pushed that through um, to, to its uh, conclusion. 
During my time on the board, we created a cultural district. We created a parking benefit district. Uh, parking demand management, my, my pet interest getting electronic or, or pay by phone meters in. I was so happy to see, see that. Um, lots of safety improvements, including the bricks are going away. And I, I've been walking to the center and I've seen that. That's huge. I remember, Mr. Hurd, you talked about that a lot. And um, um, we're finally seeing that uh, go away. Um, other transportation improvements with the dedicated bus lane, the safety improvements at, the, at, at um, Lake Street. Then the big, um, really one of the biggest ongoing initiatives around school enrollment. I know uh, Mrs. Mahan and I served on the school enrollment task force and we, we supported our colleagues across the, um, across Mass Ave to, to um, expand capacity at Hardy and Thompson, to bring the Gibbs back online and to get the, the Arlington High School on its way to being rebuilt. And, you know, I walked the dog over to the hill uh, with, at Arlington 360 to the little park and I look down and I can just see see that whole project coming up and it's so so satisfying and knowing that also uh, during the time my time on the board um, I think especially due to Mr. Dunn's leadership but but a lot of other people pitched in as well um, to see that Minuteman also um, we, we got a we negotiated a deal that's better for for Arlington than than um, than we had ever had before and um and, and a brand new Minuteman High School. We advocated for the CPA, the Community Preservation Act. Mr. Helmuth, you're one of the reasons it's been so successful, but it really has in, in pushing forward our affordable housing stock, our open space and recreation, uh, historical preservation, all of that. We, in, in the face of some really difficult debates, we, we adopted a Trust Act resolution. Uh, I, I don't know. I mean, it was the biggest hearing I ever saw in my time on the board. I don't know, Mr. Mahan, maybe you'd seen larger on, on other issues, but I, I have to say this is one of the, this is the biggest I ever saw uh, on my time on, on, on the board. Um, pushed that through, created the Rainbow Commission, expand, you know, all working with town meeting and, and working with other stakeholders. We expanded uh, protections for um, uh, uh, gender expression and identity, um, and, and took a lot of other um, important um, steps around uh, social justice, not without debate, difficulty, hard discussion. Um, I, I think the last remarks I, I, I gave at a select board meeting before I, I left was, um, advocating for uh, Indigenous Peoples Day. So I was so happy when a couple of weeks ago to see Arlington really embracing that with so many other communities around the state. So I could go on and uh, on and on, but that these were all team efforts and, and um, with the, <clears throat> how many people I serve with? Uh, I serve with seven, I think, people who I, I serve with throughout that time. Um, and, um, I know that this will go on um, in, in, in the future and uh, that, that you all uh, will be, um, you know, building some of those, those um, foundations for, for future accomplishments of, of future boards. This was a very satisfying time for me. Um, the, um, the ability, the, uh, the opportunity to meet so many people in, in, in town. Um, who had so many different interests, different views was, was wonderful. And um, uh, having the opportunity to work with you all was wonderful. So I, I'll just wish you all Godspeed. And I wanna thank you very much for, um, for bringing me back and, 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 and giving me an opportunity to say a few words, more than a few words um, to end it out. But um, thank you. Thank, thank, thank you so much, Joe. Thank you for your friendship and thank you for, for your service to the town. And as I said, we you're still very active in the community and uh, we'll, we'll see you around town. Thank you. Take care. Bye-bye. Thank, thank you. Okay. Uh, item three tonight, year-end financial report. Sandy Pooler, Deputy Town Manager, Finance Director. 
Eda Cody Comptroller. Controller. Comptroller is a collegiate term. Good evening, Mr. Puller. Good evening, uh, ladies and gentlemen. Um, just wait for one second till Ida appears. There we go. Um, so thank everyone. you very much. Uh, I must say that's a tough act to follow, but we will try to do our best by talking about uh, budget numbers. Uh, this is the second year in a row that we've been able to present an end of the year financial report to the board uh, with a, a complete year's worth of data. Uh, overall, I think uh, the numbers look good. Um, on the expense side, we kept our spending all within budget and really did not have to bail out any of our departments. On the revenue side, our revenue came in uh, on budget, uh, albeit those budgets were lower than they had been in the past because of the effects of COVID-19. We had lowered some of our revenue estimates. Um, but overall, I think we have a good balanced budget. Um, we've turned money back uh, that became part of our free cash, uh, both from our uh, department spending less than they had been budgeted for and from our revenue coming in uh, more than we had budgeted for. Uh, I think I, you've been notified of the fact that we have certified our free cash this year. Um, it's a little over $11 million, which is about in the range, slightly less than the last couple of years. Um, so that is a positive number for us. Um, and I think is reflected in some of the numbers you're gonna to see tonight. Um, so with that, I'm just gonna go through a little bit of the details um, because all departments were pretty much on budget. There really isn't a lot to say about individual department spending. Um, I think, Adam, if you would just scroll, if you would, Mr. Manager, uh, to the numbers that are on the year-to-date budget report. Um, I think looking at those, thank you, that's great. Looking at those, um, there's some text that goes along with it, but I think the, looking at the numbers is the easiest thing to see. Um, so we had um, every department turn back dollars. I think significantly DPW turned back $223,000. They did not need any supplement for uh, their snow and ice budget. So that was a positive. So uh, most of the reserve fund, which you'll see under other, got returned back to the town and became part of free cash. Um, and we did carry over um, bargaining reserve um, so that we can settle the contracts that still are unsettled. Um, net of that, there was about um, 1. Uh, $1.3 million that became part of our free cash because of uh, department spending less than they expected. Um, on the other category, uh, which are really some of our big funds, um, as you can see, the third, fourth one down, reserve fund turned back almost $1.5 million. So that is a nice healthy number. Uh, everything else came in pretty much as expected. The state assessments came in slightly higher um, as they sometimes do at the end of the year as they adjust uh, both our aid, some of our school aid and our charter aid and some of our charter assessments. So that's the reason for that. Um, our health insurance turn, turned back money uh, in a healthy amount this year, not as big as some past years, but still a healthy amount. And our other insurance, including our property insurance and our unemployment insurance did run over budget. They are voted by the finance committee together. So health insurance helped bail out other insurance. And we've made adjustments to the other insurance budget in the FY22 um, budget. So we don't expect to see deficits there going forward. And Mr. Manager, if you could just, the Warren articles all, uh, they're all pretty small. We allow these uh, dollars to carry over from year to year. So there really was not that much, um, there's really not much to say there. I do wanna focus on the revenue. 
a revenue um, turned back a total of $759,000. Um, we had uh, strong revenue in several areas, our, our taxes, even though it looks like it came in uh, below our revenue estimate, that is very typical. Collecting 99% is a very good number for, for taxes, so we felt good about that. Motor vehicle excise came in slightly above uh, our estimates um, and has been a source of free cash. We did lower those estimates very significantly in FY21 and we'll be bringing them back over the next couple of years as we see the economy turning around. Um, fees were uh, a good source of revenue, mostly because we started to get the marijuana uh, tax in there. Um, I will say that going forward in FY22, Ida and I discussed how to account for marijuana revenue, and we're going, we're going to account for it along with the hotel motel tax and the meals tax, and the Airbnb tax. And so you'll see that in a different place going forward um, it, because I think it needs its, its own line and it really is a tax. Uh, everything else uh, came in nicely, including our um, interest. We had a little bit of shortfall uh, in what's called the school account. That's our Medicaid reimbursement. And that really is because the number of students who are in school getting those services was reduced. And so our reimbursement was that for down. Uh, hotel tax and motel tax came in way above their budgets, but as you can see, their budgets were significantly lower at 60 and $50,000 than they had been in previous years and that they will be again going forward. Um, if we could just go, then go down to the next page on enterprise funds. Um, the enterprise fund, the water and sewer fund had a very strong year, I think, uh, partly because uh, of drought, so they sold more water, and partly because more people were home and used more water for that reason. Uh, and thirdly, because uh, the board has been doing a very good job of raising our rates in a timely manner so they coincide with the beginning of our, uh, our fiscal year each year, uh, so they're timely. Uh, AYCC uh, had a small surplus, COA transportation, uh, because the Senior Center uh, was closed down at a small deficit, although um, that was covered by its retained earn earnings or its what version of what we call free cash. Uh, the rink sort of amazingly enough had a small surplus um, as did the recreation fund. And I give Joe Connolly, as I often do in these meetings, a lot of credit for managing both those budgets uh, to keep them in the black. Um, in a very difficult year for both of us. Um, that will conclude my remarks at this point. I know there's a lot of backup that is attached here, um, which I think some of you may go through on your own. I think Ida or I would be happy to answer any questions about any of our spending or our revenue. Um, but again, I would just conclude that I think um, our departments did a good job of staying within our budgets. Our revenue estimates were realistic in a way that uh, gave us some surplus. And our enterprise funds um, all ran in the, the black with one small exception. And so overall, I think it's a good report. Ida, is there anything that you would like to add to that? Um, no, I think you've covered everything in enough detail. Um, the only thing I could add is that um, another thing that contributed to our healthy free cash is the turn back from the school department, which was around $347,000, which is not included in this report. Excellent. So, Mr. Chair, I think that concludes our remarks. Great. Thank you, Mr. Pula. Thank you, Ms. Cody. Um, I will now turn to the board for questions or comments. Uh, Mrs. Mahan. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, thank you, Ms. Cody and Mr. Pooler. Before I get in, I think I have two or three queries. Um, I had mentioned this last year to the manager um, after last year's report, and we had a conversation. Um, since we do have a very educated, intelligent woman who works just as hard with Mr. Pooler, and she is the comptroller for the select board, I had asked the manager. 
perhaps only because a few people after last year's meeting asked if Ms. Cody was Mr. Cooler's secretary. Um, and I said, going forward in the future to the town manager, um, maybe, you know, under revenues, we could hear from the comptroller who does report to the board. But that didn't happen. That's okay. So I would make a rec I would make a request that next year perhaps we allow Ms. Cody to um, go through um, the report, and then she can ask Mr. Pooler at the end if he has any questions after she covers it all. So, um, and then, and Mr. Pooler, feel free to have a conversation, with Mr. Chaplain, about what we spoke about last year. But I won't beat that horse any longer. Um, I'm assuming, and if the chair could nod his head, head um, if the chair will have remarks or questions around cannabis funds. Um, if you can elaborate a little bit in terms well, of- You've always been sort of following that and- Oh, um, yeah, as far as where it's broken out. Yeah, I, I will cover that when it comes to- Okay, that. thank you. So that, see, that saves you guys from one thing from me. Um, the other thing is, um, I'm pleased by my math, um, about 12 million um, in free cash um, this year alone, um, as Mr. Pooler cited the uh, transfer, um, turning back 1.5 million, as well as um, under expenses, the 1.2 million, as well as, um, uh, I think Mr. Poole referenced uh, about a million or something from the state. Um, and we do have the uh, about 750,000 also put away for collective bargaining. Um, I raise that because um, I cannot get involved in negotiations with any union or M schedule employee, except for the select board staff, the town manager, and to some extent, a comptroller, um, but I think it's no secret to the manager and my colleagues that I've been very frustrated putting opera aside, because that's up next. Um, I've been very frustrated and myself personally insulted and apologized to our town employees with um, all that money and arbitration going on and representations and in my feeling, at least one big misrepresentation or perhaps it was a misrepresentation. Um, and I know the manager has reached out um, to the unions, um, which is not over opera funding. And I'll speak about that when we get to that agenda item. Um, the only thing, as we all know, and he knows for collective bargaining, I mean, for negotiations is collective bargaining issues. The, the APRA money is a totally different candy. Um, so I just say that of note, because that, to me, that flies in the face of trying to do everything we can for our town employees who we can't thank so much. And that may be it, except for when Mr. DeCourcy goes into the cannabis question. And I'm not gonna apologize. I was gonna say I apologize for my feistiness, but I'm not because it's Groundhog Day um, all over from last year. And to my colleagues, I did speak to the manager one-on-one, -on -one, not in front of the camera, and a representation was made. It didn't happen, so that's why I'm now saying it on camera, on cable. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Hey, thank you, Mrs. Mahan. Uh, Mr. Hurd. Thank you. <clears throat> thank you to Ms. Pooler and Ms. Cody for the presentation. Um, I always do really enjoy when you do these presentations, even though I, you mentioned the finances aren't as sexy as some of the other things that we deal with. This is certainly something that we need to know. And when the report is broken out like this, it makes it very easy for some of the board members who weren't Mr. DeCourcy on the finance committee for that long amount of time to really understand where we are with our town finances. And I do appreciate that. My only question was gonna be was, it's gonna be who's director Ed Conley at the rink, but I, I think you covered that. <laughs> Joe Conley, thank you very much. I think it's a combination of Joe Conley and Ed Burns. But um, <laughs> yeah, you know, it, it is good to see the numbers in front of us. And you know, I, I do appreciate that in the midst of COVID, 
we were able to, last year, we scaled back some of our estimates to make sure that we're setting expectations with our spending. And then it's good to see that some of the revenues have well exceeded our expectations, which means we're maybe getting a little bit back to normal. Uh, we still have a long way to go, but it's this report shows positive signs, both for the town as far as finances and the residents as well as getting out of you know, we're stuck in the muck with COVID, but it looks like the end is near. So do appreciate the presentation and uh, keep up the good work. Thank, thank you, Mr. Hurd. Uh, Mr. Diggins. Oh, thank you, Mr. Chair. And, uh, so uh, good job. And I'm just going to dive into a couple of um, curiosity questions and give me as short an answer as you want. Um, and then maybe a longer um, uh, discussion about um, earnings and investments. So I see that, um, the, the move I had 25K unspent and it's on the, it's on the warrant articles. I mean, you may have explained this to me or maybe it's before my time, but, but what, what is move our 25K and why is it on the, on the warrant articles? It's an amount of money that's set aside for the legal department to engage in any possible litigation around development on the so-called Mugar site, the site that uh, is an, uh, right along route two. Gotcha. Uh, between that and the Thorndike um, Park. Got it. All right. Thanks. You know, and, uh, and, uh, and also another curiosity question. So blue bikes, I mean, uh, uh, why is that in the warrant, warrant articles? Um, it was voted as a separate um, article, uh, not within any department's budget, but okay. it was a, a separate item uh, last year. Uh, it matched 80,000 some odd dollars that came from a grant and allowed us to buy uh, and install uh, blue bike stations around town. I got you. Well, I was here for that. I should remember. <laughs> that. I mean, I, so I just, I guess I, 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 for some reason, I just felt that probably would fall under something else. But if it was an, 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 an article in the warrant, then I understand that. Thank you for that explanation. I mean, so um, on page three, you you talk about um, earnings and investments, you know, and how uh, uh, the, uh, the, Earnings that you got in investments was 170 percent, um, well, 177 percent more uh, than expected. Uh, and you talked about strategies that you had um, put into place. Care to explain? Uh, just expand on that a little bit. I'm kind of curious. Well, I would uh, first of all I'd like to give credit for our investments to our town treasurer collector Phyllis Marshall. Uh, it is under her oversight and guidance that the town invests its money. And um, so she has done a very good job of trying to find decent interest rates uh, in a very low yield environment, as we say, a low interest rate environment. Um, her job is governed by the principle of safety, liquidity, and yield. In other words, keep the town's money safe first, make sure that it's liquid so that we have access to it when we need it. And then third, get a good yield or a good interest rate on it. Um, it's been a challenge for her because interest rates are very low. Um, and I think they, they have gone up and down. Um, I, we have prepared a first quarter report, which we will present to the board at a later date. Um, but we are, we do see that sometimes that the interest earnings are not as, have not been as high even recently as they have been in the last year. So um, in sum, Phyllis has done, done a good job of finding good CDs and, and money markets to put money into. Um, we have also had a lot of money on hand because of uh, when we have overrides and so forth, we sit on that money and, and earn interest on it. Uh, both for our debt exclusions and for our um, our operating overrides, uh, so, and all, all within the override stabilization fund. Um, so I do think going forward, just so you know, I, those numbers will probably be not as high as you see here, just because for a variety of reasons, all those things are going down. Gotcha. Understand. Thank you for that explanation. And, and then one final thing, and, and I, I've been looking, trying to find uh, the um, PDF me from. I guess maybe it might've been as much as six months ago, um, you all came to us with a, um, 
requesting uh, that we sign off on a bond. I think it was for like $100,000. It was a very short term. Do you remember that one? It was a small amount and a very short term. Interest rates were really low. Um, I don't specifically remember the bond, that bond, um, anything that small. So I, okay. I, I, that's not jogging my memory. I'm, right. I'm sorry. Then, then since it doesn't, uh, it, it won't make sense to follow up um, anymore. I just need to find that paperwork. Maybe, maybe I dreamt it up. Uh, uh, and if <laughs> I do, then I'll, 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 I'll call you and have a conversation. So, so thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Diggins. Mr. Diggins, before I turn to Mr. Helmuth, could I ask you for a, a motion to receive the year-end report? Oh, just need I'll to- I'll be happy to do that. You know, okay. So I, I would very much like to make a motion to um, mo to receive the report. Great, thank you. Uh, Mr. Helmuth. Thank you. I would very much like to second Mr. Diggins' mo motion to receive the report. Um, I have nothing to add to uh, Mr. Mr. Diggins' uh, fine comments. Uh, other than to express my personal appreciation uh, for the outstanding fiscal management of the town. And I think it's been a tough year. And I think that we have a lot of people to, to thank for that. Um, it's, it's always difficult to have to, uh, to make budget adjustments when we know that you know, revenues are gonna be tough. Um, but you know, my sense is that the town manager and leading his department heads and, and all the staff have really pulled together to ensure that the services to the town have not suffered and that residents continue to get a really good value for the tax dollars. And I encourage you know, residents to, to look at reports like this, to look at the transparency, to look at the, the careful controls that we put on our budgets and that we stick to them, that we keep our promises because um, I think that's one of the most important things that a government can do for its citizens. Uh, and this report is just a really good example of, of I think, exemplary uh, work in that regard. So thank you. Thank you, Mr. Helmuth. Yeah, and just a, I just have a couple of questions. And one, I'll, I'll start with the reference Mrs. Mahan made. And I know, Mr. Poole, you mentioned that uh, you and Ms. Cody are going to be separating out the fees from the um, uh, marijuana sales, cannabis sales. Um, but if you could just break that out as far as what, uh, where it is within the, the line item or what, what percent of the, the totals uh, for, for calendar year 21 within the fees there. Uh, so uh, on page two of the uh, memo under revenue, uh, where it says that we collected 135% of our um, revenue estimate, it says this area is running ahead of estimates because of a new $158,647 of revenue from uh, the marijuana sales tax. So it is incorporated within, in the total of fee revenue in this report. Ida and I are working to change the report so you will see it as a separate line in future reports. Um, but in, in FY21, it came to $158,000. Okay, great. And I just wanted just, to add. Oh, go right ahead. Uh, I just wanted to add that this is going to pre be presented just like on the tax recap, because when we do the tax recap, this um, type of revenue it is presented as an excise. So this will be grouped together with the, the meals and um, the room excise. So this is going to be another type of excise. Great. Okay, and I, and I think that will be helpful because it is, we, we're gonna have a second location in town at some point and, and there should be more revenue. Um, and, and I think it does warrant having a separate line item. So th thank you for doing that. Um, and then a, another question on the motor vehicle excise, you said that it's below, what was collected while above budget has been below prior years. And I'm just wondering um, what were we seeing before the pandemic? Because I know car sales are, are less, there's less inventory and in, in the way the motor vehicle excise tax works, new cars pay the highest excise tax and then you have a, a falling scale. So I don't know if you could tell us, you know, perhaps wishful thinking if things start turning around after the pandemic, what we might expect to see that number sure. grow to. So uh, in FY21, we collected $4.3 million in motor vehicle excise. In FY20, previous year, 
it was just over 5 million, 5 million 49,000. And FY19 was 5 million 332,000. In FY18, it was 5 million 551,000. Um, the last time it was as low as it came in in FY21 was back in FY13 when we collected uh, just over $4 million. So I do expect it will go back up um, okay. within those ranges, uh, probably not right away. We've built in, it in in our long range plan to, to build up again over the next couple of years. Right, okay, th th thank you. And you can see the effect there, fewer newer cars, fewer newer cars being bought, it really has, has an impact. Um, so just in closing, I want to thank both uh, Mr. Poole and Ms. Cody for their work on the year-end report, but also their work with the long-range planning um, committee. And, and you can see here from this report, um, while things are, are, are well run in terms of uh, um, keeping an eye on expenses, keeping an eye on revenue, um, notwithstanding that, we still have a number of challenges ahead for fiscal years 23, 24, 25, which is it's a long range planning issue. It's not in the past, but it's there's a relationship there. And, and um, it, we appreciate the updates um, as far as where we were year end. And we look forward to, to hearing from you as the year goes on uh, as well. If I could, Mr. Chair, I just sure. wanted to make two quick remarks. One, I appreciate Mrs. Mahan's remarks about uh, the competence and abilities of our town comptroller, Ida Cody. And she and I will uh, put our heads together about how we make presentations in the future. So thank you for that suggestion. Um, I think uh, I couldn't do any of this work without Ida's work. She does a great job keeping our books together. Um, and I think you'll look forward to hearing from her more in the future. Um, I would also just say uh, there were some remarks made about our collective bargaining. Uh, since I'm the person along with uh, Karen Malloy who does that collective bargaining, I just want to say, I think there may be some personal differences of opinion about how we bargain, uh, but I uh, take a lot of pride in protecting the town's interests, offering fair contracts to our employees. I think that was ratified by the recent arbitration award, which affirmed the town's position. And so I don't want anybody at home being under the impression that there's something wrong with our collective bargaining. That is my two cents as somebody does the bargaining. I appreciate the ability to share my views. Thank you very much. Okay, thank, thank you, Mr. Pooler. Um, all right, so on a motion to receive by Mr. Diggins, seconded by Mr. Helmuth, Attorney Hein. Mr. Hurd. Yes. Mr. Diggins. Yes. Mr. Helmuth. Yes. Mrs. Mahan. Yes. Mr. DeCourcy. Yes. It's unanimous vote. Okay, thank, thank you both for, for the presentation tonight. All right, so given the time we have, the ARPA funding is the next item on the agenda. I'm gonna ask the board, we noticed a hearing for Eversource for 815, it's now 814. Um, what I'd like to do is, um, well, maybe we can be, a, what, what I'd like to do is maybe go to um, item number six because it's related to number seven. It's only gonna take a minute or two then go to the hearing for Eversource, and then we'll go back to number four. Um, if, if anybody, if that's okay with the board. Okay, great. Um, all right, so we will now go to item number six, um, removal of double polls. I asked, or I put this on the agenda, um, back in November of 2020, um, it was either Eversource or Verizon that was in, I believe it was Eversource on that night. Um, I raised the question about double polls and, and one in particular that, that had troubled me was across was on Mass Ave across the street from Elmhurst Street because we'd approved a certain type of, um, we had approved something called a hip guy. A double pole was installed and the double pole is still there. It was there on November 9th. It was there presently. So if I could ask Mr. Chapdelaine perhaps to share the screen for a moment, not on the pictures, but on the items related to this agenda item and, and I'd like to start with the 
statute and then the list. And, and again, I'll try to keep this under a couple minutes, but it's, it's more a discussion point and, and something that I'd like to see us try to do going forward when we have requests from the utility companies. So what we're gonna see here is this, this is a statute that deals with double poles, chapter 164, section 34B. And what it says is if, if a um, distribution, electric distribution company, a telephone company uh, installs a new pole, the removal of the existing pole from the site shall occur within 90 days. Um, one of the problems, one of the major problems with the statute is there's no, if, if there's no compliance with the statute, there's no fine, there's no sanction or anything like that. And we have talked to our, our legislative delegation. I know Mr. Chaplin has had discussions within MMA and it's the type of thing where I really think going forward, there needs to be some annual progress towards the goal of, in, of, of uh, removing double poles. If you could put the next page up uh, or the, the, the other attachment here, and for those of you writing statutes, if you have a directive, you usually want to have a condition or sanction or fine, whatever it is, if there's no compliance, it doesn't happen there. Um, the, other, the other screen was the DPU report, Mr. Chapdelaine. Okay, this is just a summary. So the, the utility companies, and, and it's mainly Verizon and Arlington, they, they maintain the polls, although Eversource as you can see there is poll owner number two. This is a copy of the report that was filed with the state, with the DPU um, for the period May 1, 2020 through October 31, 2020. Um, the highlighted part there in yellow basically says as of May 1, 2020, there was 145 double polls. As of October 31, there was 148. So rather than um, decreasing the amount, we actually saw an increase and there is detail on the subsequent pages. And I will tell you of the 148 polls, double polls in the town of Arlington, there was only one on that list that was in potential compliance with chapter 164, section 34B. It was only one double poll that had been in existence for less than 90 days. It's, it's one that goes back as far as 2004, I think on, on Marathon Street. Um, and again, this is an issue where we get requests from Eversource and from Verizon. And I think we really need to start asking, what are you doing to reduce this backlog? Because it's gone on too far. There's some streets um, where you see multiple polls. I, Mr. Chapdelin, if you could share a couple pictures here that we have. Um, Okay, this is Warren Street. This one's been on for years. That's a double pole blocking the sidewalk. There's absolutely no need for, the, for that type of you know, impediment uh, on the street there. There's a couple others on Warren Street. That's the type of thing that people get upset about when they see a double pole. And it's the type of thing that we expect um, to be removed. And, and, and you, know, you couldn't get by there, it's not accessible. Um, there's another one, I think there's one or two more. Apologies, I, I, I can't scroll through them. I have to reshare. Um, it's okay, sorry about that. No, it's okay. All right, this is the corner of Adams Street and Mass Ave, across the street from Walgreens. It's an absolute disgrace. This poll, and I think there's another poll that shows what it looks like, step back. Um, that's the type of thing where, you know, we really would like to see some cooperation from Verizon and Everson, there it is right there, okay? And it's been there a long time. You could argue it's an attractive nuisance in terms of people, you know, you know children maybe going up to it and, and it's dangerous, there's a lot of charred wood there. Um, that's the type of thing that gets communities upset when you see double poles. So I raise this because I'd, I'd like the board to consider, and I'm not suggesting it tonight, but I think we use the October 2020 report um, the report for the period ending May 31, 2021 is not available yet, but use that 148 polls as a baseline. And anytime Verizon or, or Eversource, because they do have a role here, come in, ask them what they're doing for progress towards reducing that. And I'm not looking for full compliance with the statute. That's impossible at this point, but I am looking for progress. 
And I think as a board, we really should consider if we're not seeing progress, we table requests in certain instances until we either get a response or we see some progress. So I'm not looking for a, a vote from the board. I don't know if any other members want to comment. Uh, if you do, if you want to signal um, by hand, um, I wanted to raise this before the public hearing. And again, I'm not suggesting that we hold up this request, but I think we make it known that we want some cooperation. We want to work with the utilities, but these double polls, the number need to be reduced in town. Mrs. Mahan. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. And thank you for putting this on. Um, just a very brief sort of anecdotal history. Um, when I first got on the board in 99, within my first um, term, um, not so much double polls because they weren't as commonplace as they are now, but the condition of existing ones and getting them replaced was discussed. Um, and I remember uh, initially we did start denying um, requests as they came in, unless it was something that was really essential. Um, and <clears throat> we did get some movement on that. Um, uh, not all the sites we identified were replaced, um, uh, but action was done on that. Since that time, uh, twice when I've been on the board, but I have unfortunately not been chair, um, the issue has come up. And then there's discussion with the utilities and um, we don't take the step of uh, delaying the request um, because there's been made a good faith effort that there will be some movement on it. Um, so I'm just saying that um, I think, I know I'm in favor of what the chair um, is proposing um, because uh, I know everybody wants to, get this issue addressed. Um, but I think it's kind of maybe like the squeaky wheel because the only time I saw a movement from the utilities companies, utility companies was um, when the then board and chair, which was not me, um, took a similar step. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Thank you, Mrs. Mahan. Mr. Diggins. Yes, Mr. thank you, Mr. Chair. I mean, I support your position. You know, I, I, I would be interested in finding out what our legislators could do about it because I mean, as you say, as you, you've pointed out, I mean, there is no teeth I mean, uh, in the legislation. I mean, and I mean, these things don't happen by accident. I mean, I'm sure it happened a while ago, but it might be that there is a appetite for doing something more. Uh, I mean, my concern about I me mean, not granting I me mean, what they're asking for is that we may be cutting off our nose to spite our face. I mean, if indeed what they want to do is something that's going to benefit I me and our residents, I mean, we don't want to stop them from doing that. I mean, and certainly as a pedestrian, you know, I think we maybe could I mean, find some way I mean, to put some pressure based on ADA compliance. I mean, so, so whereas the statute may not have any teeth behind it, there may be other statutes that we could use. So we could still grant them what they want, but still come at them I mean, uh, with um, some, some other way, in some other legal way. And, um, and also in, in, in trying to get some legislation, I mean, it'll raise the profile of it and there's kind of like, I mean, bad press can kind of go away towards getting people to, to comply. I mean, it may be that, I mean, Eversource and, and um, um, other utilities feel that they're too big for that, but they may find out that's different. So that's it, thank you. Thank you, Mr. Diggins. And, and, and as far as I'm concerned, we're talking mainly Verizon, but we're also talking Eversource as well as a, as a second owner. Um, Mr. Hurd, I don't know if you have any comments. Yeah, so I just wanted to, again, thank you for your efforts. I know you're you're often on the, the double poll issue and with every, all the issues that we face at this board and in the town, sometimes it gets put on the back burner, but I know it is something that a lot of residents are concerned about and for good reason. So it's, I appreciate you bringing this up. And just like the statute with no teeth, I guess if our board just lets it pass by too without any consequence, then there's really not gonna be any movement as well. So I would be on board trying to figure out what we can do to incentivize the utilities to fix these issues, because given the current rate, it just seems like we're gonna have more and more double poles as fewer are resolved and more are implemented uh, as years pass. So I think it's about time to work with the utilities. Hopefully we can work with them 
to resolve this issue and not against them. But again, I appreciate the efforts in bringing this before us. Thank you, Mr. Hurd. Mr. Helmuth. Yeah, thank you. I, I appreciate your leadership on this, Mr. Chair. And I also appreciate Mrs. Mahan's uh, position of being able to remind us and, and, and tell us what, you know, what, what happened in the past. It's really important to, to know. Um, and I support your suggestions and I trust that you will um, notify the board of an opportunity when you say you think there is a chance that we can um, ask the tough questions and even contemplate uh, some, some kind of consequences. Um, thank you, Mr. Helmuth. So, so that that covers no vote is necessary on on number six. I just I needed to get that off my chest and and and, um, and, and, and talk about it. and I appreciate the board's comments. Um, okay, let's go to item seven, which is a public hearing, Eversource petition, Mass Ave and Lachlan Ave, Jacqueline Duffy, Supervisor of Rights and Permits. This is a public hearing, so we will allow for public comment after the presentation as well. Hi, how are you tonight? Good evening, Miss Duffy. How are you? I am. Um, how are you? Good, thank you. I had taken a couple of pictures from the video that you that you've sent tonight, and I will send them to Verizon for you. And I I took pictures of the the list, and I I, I already sent it to my email at work, so I can send that to Verizon also. And and I have sent it to the manager of Somerville Service Center, so we can work with you to get rid of these double polls. That last poll was just crazy. I've never seen one like that before in my 40 yeah. years that I've worked here. But tonight I'm looking for um, an installation on Mass Ave at Lachlan Avenue for 196 feet of conduit. And this is to supply power to a new building at 882-892 Mass Ave. Okay. Thank, thank you. And this, this is the new building going in diagonally across the street from, from Arlington High School. And I appreciate your comments, Ms. Duffy. And Mr. Hurd said, I mean, we want to work with you and we want to work with Verizon, but it's just, there's a level of frustration. And as you, as you mentioned, when you see a picture like that on, on our, our main street, it's, it's very frustrating. So yes, appreciate your comments. It is, it is Verizon set, but we have to make sure that all the other utilities are off before Verizon can remove the pole. Okay. So I will, Thank I will um, send everything to Verizon when I get off the Zoom call. Great. We, we appreciate that. Um, all right. I will turn to the board, Mr. Hurd. Thank you. And thank you, Ms. Duffy, for accepting our comments and uh, offering to work with us on the issue. This is certainly not one of the requests that we'd want to forestall because it's for one of our, our, our property owners. So I will move approval of the request. Thank you, Mr. Hurd. Um, Mrs. Mahan. Um, I will definitely second that request as well as, <clears throat> excuse me, taking my remarks on the previous item. Um, I, I will say in all the years since I've been on the board, I've worked with Ms. Stuffy um, and she's true, true to her word. Um, and she'll also, if something comes back that it's hit a brick wall, she'll tell you that. Um, so um, I, I take her words um, very seriously. And I can tell you over the years I've contacted um, Ms. Stuffy, sometimes Joe Nolan, years ago, Tom May, for Arlington issues, whether they were a massive days, um, outages, you know, four, five, six days, and then they upgraded the infrastructure here in Arlington. And sometimes I've called her with, you know, someone in the house and there's a, an issue with electricity and they have a generator that's going to last, you know, for oxygen and things like that. And she responds within the hour. So, um, so uh, I want to thank the chair and Ms. Stuffy uh, for that. But I still want to, you know, keep, as long as the chair um, feels that there actually is an end in sight um, or movement um, on this, um, I'll wait to hear from him. So thank you very much. I think I seconded it. <laughs> yes, you did. Uh, thank you, Mrs. Mahan. Uh, Mr. Diggins. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, does that um, memo from um, Mr. Chenard apply to this? 
Yeah, in, in terms of conditions or yes. Yeah, so I mean, what we can do is is if, if it's okay with Mr. Hurd, will uh, the, the approval will, will be subject to the conditions? Yes, because I mean they're good conditions. You know, yeah. you know, Mr. Shapiro, I mean, he tells it like it is. You know, and and I mean, I I read this. You know, and I, and I was I was just impressed with his thoroughness. You know, as I was going through it, I was going, oh, I mean, the initial request was like, oh man, I mean, I don't know what to make of this. Which we had an engineer that looked at it, and one did, and came up with I thought some really good conditions. So definitely with those conditions. So thank you. Okay, thank thank you, Mr. Diggins, Mr. Helmuth. No comments. Happy to support the motion. Okay, um, this is a public hearing, so the public um, is welcome to comment on this request. Um, Mr. Chaplain, I don't know if anybody has their hand up on this one. There are no hands raised right now, Mr. Chair. Okay, thank you. And I will support this as well. And, and, and my intent tonight wasn't to put this one off. As I said, I'd like to use that report as a baseline to see where we go um, in, the, in the future in, in terms of progress. Ms. Duffy, I really appreciate your comments and, and your willingness to look into this. So uh, on a motion by Mr. Hurd, seconded by Mrs. Mahan, Attorney Heim. Mr. Hurd? Yes. Mr. Diggins? Yes. Mr. Helmer? Sorry. Yes. Mrs. Mahan? Yes, thank you. Mr. DeCourcy? Yes. Unanimous vote. Great, okay. Thank, thank you. you. Thank you. Uh, all right, so now we will go back to agenda item number four, our funding presentation uh, by Mr. Chapterline. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, I will try to be as efficient as possible with time. Um, I'd like to do uh, a series of things. One, I'd like to walk through updates that I've made to the proposed framework since we, since we last spoke. Then I would like to share on the screen the proposed voted motions that I provided for the board's consideration tonight. Um, and then actually in between those two, just make a couple of comments about some later breaking requests that have come into the board um, that I'd like to just provide a little bit of clarity on a path forward for. So with that, I will share a spreadsheet. Okay. Can everybody see those numbers? Are they of adequate size? See a thumbs up, okay. So I will st I'll start right at the top. Um, I made a series of reductions since we last spoke to the revenue loss slash general fund category in order to make some of the other changes that I'll detail uh, in just a moment. Public health as well as equity and outreach remain the same as the last time the board viewed this plan. The next category, in uh, row nine, premium pay for town slash school essential workers have increased to $4 million. Um, that's an approximate $750,000 increase from the last time this board uh, reviewed this plan. Um, once again, trying to hear the thoughts, concerns, and wishes of the board's um, board members as was expressed at the last meeting. I do wanna note, um, I was able to speak to the presidents of both the police and fire unions, the patrol officers union and the fire union today, specifically uh, to inquire very briefly about their thoughts around ARPA and premium pay, as well as to commit to them um, a desire to begin bargaining as soon as possible and as soon as these figures are endorsed by the board enabling me to move forward. Next based on suggestions, feedback, uh, and I guess prompting from several board members, I've added a category of premium pay for private sector essential workers in the amount of $500,000, as you see reported here. I don't have tonight greater detail um, to offer in terms of what a program in that regard would look like, um, but I did wanna put that figure in again in response to what I've heard from several board members. Um, I think it's, it's I, say, I guess it's a good thing that today, the House, uh, the House of Representatives on Beacon Hill released their ARPA slash surplus bill, which contained monies for both premium pay for what they were calling frontline state employees, as well as premium pay for 
low wage private sector and essential workers. Uh, so we are, we've been able to create uh, a good parallel here. Next, um, behavioral health support has remained the same since the last time the board reviewed this plan. There's no further changes until we get down to food security. Uh, once again, in an attempt to be responsive to feedback, uh, questions and comments from board members, what I added to the food security line was a $100,000 reserve in each of the first three years. And let me just scroll over and a $50,000 amount in the last year, creating overall a $350,000 reserve for food security. I did this really for two primary reasons. One, to be able to ensure there's adequate resources under this category to talk further with the applicants, uh, the two primary food security agencies in Arlington to ensure that we are adequately meeting their needs, but also to set aside funds for a suggestion of a potential initiation of a community kitchen in Arlington, uh, a project that would take more research and work, but I wanted to make sure we did have resources allocated for that potential. Making To make all of this possible, um, I not only had to reduce, um, as I mentioned earlier, the revenue loss category, but I did modest, uh, modestly reduce the amounts that had been contained in the uh, HVAC improvements, as well as improvements to parks and open spaces. Uh, so there's been slight reductions in those two amounts. Everything else uh, in the plan remains the same as the board had seen uh, in the prior iteration. What I'd like to say before moving over to the vote is that I know the board has seen a request that was sent in last week by the Chamber of Commerce requesting direct support of their efforts focused on economic revitalization and recovery uh, as a separate request from any assistance that might be granted under the Small Business and Nonprofit Assistance Program. I, it, was, it wasn't timely such that changes could be made to consider that request tonight. However, I communicated with the leadership of the Chamber of Commerce that I would be happy to engage in a conversation with them about finding a way um, to see if we could fulfill that request in a future iteration of this plan. And I think as you'll see in the proposed votes, there are enough categories for which more work needs to be done on such that I feel confident being able to come back to the board um, with recommendations to fulfill that after a discussion with the Chamber of Commerce. Additionally, um, I've received communication and I believe the board has received communication about the Arlington Housing Authority's interest in purchasing affordable condominium units um, and asking for that authorization tonight. My response to the Housing Authority board member that's reached out to me about that um, was simply to say that I think it is a very good idea, but that I would be proposing tonight or asking tonight for the board to endorse the categories uh, or endorse the the allocation, excuse me, for the category of affordable housing, but to await further analysis and then a programmatic recommendation for the expenditure of the affordable housing funds. I would presume there's a very strong likelihood that we would come back and recommend utilizing some portion of this funding to help the housing authority acquire units, but I think it would be um, most responsible to do so as part of a comprehensive recommendation for the allocation uh, of these affordable housing funds. Um, so I thought it was important to acknowledge that and acknowledge how we're thinking about moving forward in that regard. Finally, before going to the vote, I will say I did have the opportunity to meet with our legislative delegation today virtually, Representative Garberly, Representative Rogers, and Senator Friedman to share with them this framework in its current form, uh, and also to learn from them more about what the legislature is thinking in terms of their ARPA and surplus expenditures. Um, I will be preparing uh, some potential requests that our uh, House delegation members will work together to file as potential amendments to the bill that was released by the House today, and then work in collaboration with Senator Friedman's office as well if any of those amendments are successful in the House. Uh, it does seem overall, uh, I know I focused on premium pay uh, a moment earlier, does seem overall like the House's package aligns quite nicely with how we've already thought about prioritizing these expenditures with money being made available for economic recovery, affordable housing, 
premium pay. Uh, so I think we will be in good position to be able to potentially leverage some of these funds that would be made available by the state. Uh, HVAC improvements, I left that off. They also are putting a significant amount of money towards HVAC improvements. With that, I'm gonna stop sharing and just switch documents for one moment. So what I've done here, just trying to see if I can scroll here. I've broken down a motion for the board's consideration into two categories. Um, and just for, for those at home, what I'll say is the first category, the motion is suggesting or asking for the board to endorse the following expenditures by category and the implementation of programs recommended within each category per memorandum provided to the board by relevant town departments. And what you'll see here is I've listed the public health category, which has been outlined uh, by Director of Health and Human Services, Christine Bongiorno, the premium pay for town and school essential workers, which though not outlined by a memorandum, um, I think we've discussed at length, and I would immediately begin working to bargain or sit with unions to figure out exactly how that will be um, rolled out by, by different employee groups. Behavioral health support, two of the categories that have been outlined, again, via memorandum from Director of Health and Human Services, Christine Bargiorno, small business and nonprofit assistance and tenant assistance, which have been spelled out in memorandum by Director of Com uh, Planning and Community Development, Jenny Rate, and then administration and oversight, which will allow us not only to pay for outside auditing firms, but to uh, hire either an employee or potentially a consultancy to help us with the management and administration of these funds over the course of the next several years. Below that, for the second section, what I'm asking for is an endorsement of the following allocations by category, with the understanding that further endorse endorsement will be sought following the development and presentation of programmatic details for each of the categories. So you'll see here the first category being revenue loss general fund. Um, really that money is just being set aside while we wait to see if we can have um, treasury make some changes that would be advantageous to us to allow us to gain that benefit. Next would be the equity and outreach funds for which a plan is currently being developed. Premium pay for private sector essential workers. As I mentioned earlier, uh, the money's been set aside, but a plan for its potential distribution would still need to be developed. The behavioral health reserve, uh, just as it's called, that's been set aside as a reserve for potential needs as they might identify themselves. So I will come back in the future for potential requests from that fund. Low income broadband support, we're still working to understand whether or not those funds could be expended in Arlington based on the federal rule, um, but setting those aside now uh, would allow us to do that in the future. Providing food security, uh, I think we have a clearer idea of what we would wanna do with food security funds, especially for Food Link and Arlington Eats, but I'd like a little more time to work through that with each of those agencies, but would like the board's endorsement of that total amount to be committed to food security. HVAC improvements and investment in parks and open spaces, very similarly, um, clear what we want to make those investments in, but we need more time to delineate and outline exactly what we want to expend those funds on. I think HVAC improvements will take us a little more time um, as we go through our building electrification study. Investment in parks and open spaces, we might be able to come back as early as the next meeting with a plan that's being put together by Recreation Director Joe Conley. Water sewer spending, uh, $6.6 .6 million, of which 1.6 has already been endorsed by a board vote back in August. Probably similar to parks and open spaces, Mr. Rademacher in Public Works would be able to very quickly put together um, his prioritized plan for those funds. Affordable housing uh, in that total amount, though I think delineated quite specifically about where we are thinking about focusing them, it's likely that I would come back for endorsement in chunks for each of these amounts of money. I'd like to be able to, if the, if the board does vote to endorse it in its current form tonight, begin working immediately with the Housing Authority to hammer out an understanding and an agreement for the funds to make repairs to Monotomy Manor, 
and then spend a little more time on coming forward with a proposal for affordable housing unit production and or the deepening of affordability of units in the pipeline. And then finally, the homelessness line, again, of which $50,000 was already endorsed by the board for a vote in August to be distributed to the Housing Corporation of Arlington for a homelessness prevention program that they're running. Um, but the rest of these funds are actually actively working um, both internally and externally with a group of students from the Harvard Kennedy School in their graduate program to work on um, to work on potential long range solutions to the homelessness problem in the challenge in Arlington. So with that, that is the entirety of what I wanted to share for the board tonight. And I'd be happy to answer any questions you have and would look forward to your consideration of these two um, categorized votes of endorsement. Thank, thank you, Mr. Chapterlain. So I'm gonna turn to the board, but just last meeting we had run out of time. So I said that we would take public comment on this issue. What I would like to do is get initial comments from board members, then receive comments if there's anybody from the public that would like to speak. And, and we'll, we'll try to bear in mind that we've got a bunch of things coming up on the agenda afterwards, then return to board members after that. So I'm gonna start with the board, go to the public and the public can start raising their hand if they would like to get on the, on the, on the list here for speakers. And I'll start with Mr. Helmuth. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Uh, so would you suggest if, if a board member would be inclined to move approval on this, this would be a good time or would you suggest uh, to do that in the second round of board comments? Well, I, I, you, I, you know, it's up to you, but it, you may wanna hear from, from everybody beforehand. I mean, I, I think we will be coming back to board members after we hear from the public. So if you have particular comments on, but I leave it, I, I, I leave it up to you, but the, we will be coming back yeah, a second yeah. time to no, board that's, members. That's, yeah, that's, that sounds right to me as well. Um, so yeah, thank you. And thank you, Mr. Town Manager, uh, for, for your responsiveness to the board, to the community. I, I was grateful for the, uh, for the additional uh, reserves for the food security area. And uh, you and I have talked about that um, at length. And, and I appreciate the, the increase in premium, kit, premium pay as well, and the addition of the category for private sector. Um, you know, the, that discussion, I think, has really, uh, it, it, my reading of the, the statute and, and of the, the, the federal rule about that really is consistent with the spirit of that. And I think that we saw that reinforced today in the House's uh, release, the State House release, um, of, their, of their thoughts about premium pay, which is that you know, a lot of workers deserve that consideration including the workers that we've talked about, but I think that you know, the, the spirit of that is very clearly does emphasize uh, the workers who have had to face COVID risky conditions and not have very high salaries. So I think that the, the care uh, for those folks is, is evident in, in this plan and I'm happy to support that. Um, I just had a quick question if you could and I apologize if I just missed this. Um, if you could give me an idea of what the equity and outreach category kinds of, of program or, or work that could be, what that could look like. I know you said that you'll come back to us with something, but it, this is just um, just so I get a sense for what that what that could be. So, uh, Mr. Chair, through you to Mr. Helmuth, I yes. um, I do plan to work with Jill Harvey, our director of DEI, to really outline that. But the two main focuses that I think we can focus on or utilize those funds for would be to provide translation services, not only for the documents and programmatic applications or whatever they might be for ARPA related programs, but really for a broader set of documents um, and programs and offerings that the town offers in general. Uh, so that would be one. The second would be finding the right way to enhance um, the potential for staff community engagement capacity. Mm -hmm. I know that um, Jill has a lot of interest in finding the right ways to broaden her community engagement, mm -hmm. especially with communities of color and vulnerable populations in Arlington. Um, but Jill is one person. Uh, and that's been matched up with expressions from really, I would say many people in the community asking us to figure out if there was a way to fund uh, a community engagement position in town. So I need to work through that a little more with Jill and make sure that we could put something together that's the right fit and is also eligible for the use of these funds. Mm -hmm. But um, at least sitting here tonight, I think it would be primarily focused on enhancing community engagement and providing translation services. Thank you. Um, I'm glad I asked actually that both of those sound really good to me. Uh, you know, I have to say as the, as the uh, board member who 
who recently came off of, of a campaign season. And what, you know, the great thing about running for public office is that you do a lot of listening. And I heard a lot from a lot of community members about the town's commitment to equity and a real appetite and desire to do more and to do, especially in the outreach department um, of, of really being proactive in, in making our town government accessible to people who um, don't feel like they naturally have a voice, don't feel that confidence to walk into town hall, may not be so easy for them to do that because they're holding down two jobs um, and on all of that. So uh, I'm really interested in, in that category and I encourage you and, and Ms. Harvey, uh, who I think the world of, um, to, uh, to continue that line of work. I think that it, for me, it's another reflection uh, of our values uh, that the ARPA budget is an opportunity it is a reflection of our values and how we see our community's need. And there's a lot of need and a lot of opportunity, but I really like what I'm seeing in, in this balanced uh, view that takes into account uh, rewarding our employees who've done really, really well and, and bravely under certain cir under difficult circum uh, circumstances, making public infrastructure investments that are important and, 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 and possible, but also uh, taking care of, of the people in the community who are least advantaged. That's really important to me. I think that's really important to a majority of Arlington residents. So, uh, so thanks for, for all of that, both in this category and, and throughout, the, throughout the proposed budget. Thank, thank you, Mr. Helmuth. Mr. Diggins. Thanks, Mr. Chair. Yes, I'm, I'm happy with what I see too. Uh, and, and you know, um, as a person who didn't grow up with much money, I mean, I never resented rich people, uh, uh, and and I'm always fine with with rich people making more money. I just wanted poor people to have enough, you know. So they weren't poor, you know. That's all, you know. And 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 we can get there. And 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 one of the things when doing some research about the, the um, pay for um, um, frontline workers, me low income workers, me. Uh, a lot of places, in fact, hardly anyone's doing it uh, because it's hard. And it's like, you know, how do you figure out who they are and, and, and any number of reasons for why it's just seemingly impossible to do it. But we really do poor people more, but even more of a disservice by putting them in a position where we, they are suffering and then going, but it's so now hard to figure out who you are that we're not even going to try it, um, and so so we, we've got to try it, um, and we'll learn something in the process. And 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 so I I applaud our effort to try. And as I told the town manager, we, uh, I'm the sort of manager who who doesn't like to just tell someone else to do something. It's like I like to get in there and and and, and try to help too. So to the extent you'll have my help, I'm willing to help out however I can. You know, doing research. Just tell me what you want. Want me to do to help um, with solve it, solving this problem, or at least trying to solve the problem, um, of finding out who they are in town. And we may find out that we need more resources. But you know what? I'm glad the state is is helping out on this because I don't want this to turn into a battle. I mean, for who gets what? I mean, let's just try to give um, everyone more because everyone's been through a rough time, and everyone could use some more assistance. I mean, and for those who maybe get more assistance than they need, they, they can always donate you know, that money to some worthy cause. Uh, in town, so so um, I I am pleased with what I see, and and um, that um, community kitchen could become a nice incubator space that I think the um, the chamber of commerce might even have a role in. So so um, let's go forward. I mean, let's see what the state and the federal government um, helps out, um, provides more um, additional help, and and build on that. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Diggins. Mr. Hurd. Thank you, Mr. Chair, and thank you, Mr. Chaplain, for the presentation. You know, this is the third or fourth or fifth meeting that we've gone through the ARPA funds, and I know there's been many iterations of the numbers that we've seen. I do want to thank Tom Manager for heeding our, you know, one of the issues that I really talked about was premium pay in the last couple of meetings, and the numbers going in the right direction, and the $4 million is the amount that I suggested in the last meeting. So I do want to thank the town manager for taking that into consideration and moving that number up. I know there's a lot of different opinions on the premium pay and it would be nice for us to just say, let's max out every employee in town, but there's more considerations. And 
I think the $4 million is a good number to allow the town manager to work with the unions to, to make sure everyone's fully compensated for what, for all the vast efforts that they put in during the pandemic, but particularly our first responders. We've talked about this in past meetings and shared stories about first responders that we've talked to and a lot of the sacrifices that they've had to make. And I, me, Mrs. Mahan and Chair DeCourcy recently, this past week attended the firefighters retirement party and had another opportunity to talk to many, many firefighters and there were a few officers there about really how hard the past year was on them. And I know, and um, these are a lot of these expenses that they'll recover aren't, it's not a bonus. It's, it's really compensating them for expenses that they've had during the pandemic and really some incredibly scary experiences that they've had. So again, I do want to thank all of our first responders for all the efforts that they have done during the pandemic and continue to do. Um, and I hope we can, you know, I'm confident we can come to a, a fair allocation of the premium pay. Um, I, my one question left over from P premium pay is, you know, we have a flat number here and I think Ms. Chaplin has a lot of work to do with the various unions and I know it includes school department workers. Now, are we gonna have an opportunity to, once the negotiations are, are underway and you come up with figures that look relatively final, are we gonna have an opportunity to, to review the amount allocated to the individual workers to approve that as well? Or are we just approving the 4 million and you'll let us know one where it was spent. I, I guess what I'm saying is, is it, are we going to be have an opportunity to see the individual allocations and approve that? Mr. Chairman. Yep. Thank you, sure. Mr. Chairman. Th uh, three to Mr. Hurd. Uh, so I, I'm open to discussing that with the board. Um, I do think it make it could potentially make discussions. Uh, more complex and more complicated to need to seek further board approval in the future. Um, but if the board's preference is to have uh, an approval over it, I would certainly assent to that request. Um, at the very least, I would absolutely bring back to the board a presentation of how the figures broke down, uh, but I, I'm open to the board's um, preference or prerogative in that regard. Yeah, and I can hear from my colleagues and I can speak with you offline as well. I just, like I said, we just see one big number for that encompasses the work of a lot of people. And it would be good to, at some point, and I don't wanna overcomplicate things. I don't, I definitely don't wanna delay our workers being paid, but it would be good to, at least from my perspective, to take a second look at what the actual breakdown will be once the negotiations are underway. Um, then I, I did have a question I, and I think you've, touched on this for the premium pay for the private sector workers. And I thank Mr. Diggins for, for bringing this up as well. And I think that's great. I, I think it, it is good to, when it was first raised last week and it was kind of in the midst of the premium pay discussion um, for our town workers, it, it seemed almost an impossible task to try to to figure out how we could pay private sector workers, but there's a lot of private sector workers who are in need, who did a lot of work that helped keep our community going during the pandemic, particularly during the shutdown. So I would be interested to see what the, what the parameters would be, again, once they're figured out as to who will qualify. But I think that's certainly one category, which I assume would have been one of the parameters anyway, that we could have a pretty strict income level where there'll be a cutoff as far as income. And I think that will help kind of weed out the people that really needed this, that were, that were essential workers. Because I remember when the essential worker list came out and I was looking at it to see if I could stay home, I learned that there, I was a, I don't know how lawyers are essential workers for anybody, but it, it, it's a broad list. So there's certainly 
we would want to make sure that that particular category is going specifically to those most in need. And I know this is something that you would take into account anyways, but I just wanted to say that, and that's another category that I would like to have it, it, you just come back to us and just let us know how the allocation is going to be, particularly before we start um, accepting applicants, because then we'll know who we can contact to for those funds. Um, but otherwise, you know, I know we've made some adjustments, and one of these, one of the drawbacks of having a set amount of money is when we ask for more money in one category, it pulls from another category. But you know, this is a, a work in progress. It will progress over a couple of years. And I do think that the allocations to premium pay were, were necessary in this first year since it's a one-shot deal for premium pay. So I do appreciate that. That's it. Thank you, Mr. Hurd. Uh, Mrs. Mahan. Um, thank you, Mr. Chair. And uh, before my remarks, um, which because of what's before us, a little bit of the wind in my sails have been taken out, has been taken out, so they'll be shorter in that aspect. Um, I've done this a couple of times at the select board meeting, and people have asked me if there was some message behind it. Um, and I did it again tonight during Mr. De the chairman's presentation. I, I have my audio and video on this laptop. When screen share comes on, I have to turn to my right. Um, to look at what's being saved. I do have it printed out, but I always look what's on the screen in case it changed. And if you see my head tilt, it's just because there's some columns that I need to tilt my head a little bit to um, look at them. I'm not trying to send a message or cast any aspersion. So I just wanted to make that clear. It's amazing what some people, which they're curious. Okay. Um, trying to keep it. Uh, Sort of, I guess, again, um, dovetail on Mr. Hurd and my colleagues' remarks, um, starting with the private sector es essential employees. Um, I, I totally agree it's not going to be an easy task, but it certainly is an insurmountable. Um, part of the um, work that needs to be done is not only identifying the Arlington residents and or uh, when the manager last week said, I think he said consultants or contractors, the only one that I could think of that seemed justified that may not be Arlington residents are the um, sanitation and cleaning crews that I see at town hall since day one um, coming out to, to do that. Beyond that, in terms of, I would like to see, and the manager said he'll be giving it to us in the future, as my colleagues have said, sort of um, what the parameters of that are. But also, what I also like to see more importantly, um, when I grew up in Monotomy Manor, I never knew it had that name. It was the bricks, the duplex, and another word that I, I can't say at a select board meeting. Um, but one of the things um, I knew going down there, um, a lot of families, a lot of um, individuals, head of households working two or three jobs and still not making uh, a living wage, a decent living wage. Um, you need to have, you need to approach them in a way that, that um, and it's not something they have to worry about, but I can tell you as somebody who's been in that position, in the family position, sometimes you're a little fearful to ask for help, especially if it's somebody or an agency that you've never had contact with. Um, sometimes you're fearful um, because you're, that you're gonna ask for help and you're gonna lose some other funding you're getting or you're gonna see your rent go up. I know when I lived in the duplex, um, there was a big fear of that. Um, and I hear it and to some extent um, happens today. So I would say to our health and human services director or whoever else the manager um, tasked with this, um, uh, to get to, the town workers, or some of them with the Homeless Coalition um, through the Arlington Police Department, um, through Food Link, um, through anyone um, that has is providing to an, uh, services to an Arlington resident, maybe the person that picks them up in the Council on Aging, or if you're disabled and, and gets you to work, 
um, that we um, enable or employ them or encourage them to speak to, to these constituent groups to say, listen, this is the real deal. It's money you're entitled for. Nothing bad's gonna happen. Um, uh, and I know that's something that obviously is gonna be thought about, but just someone who's lived it, lived the dream. <laughs> Um, I know what it is, you know, I think there were several programs, perhaps back when I was growing up. So I remember suggesting them to my parents. Um, and that's sort of from there. Um, regarding the state APRA funding, um, and I believe the PFFM was at their conference today, I think it was Hyannis. Um, pretty much everybody around the state, and I'm not trying to be like a Debbie Downer or anything like that, but and I know the legislative delegation is going to say, oh, we can help work on that. Pretty much that money's uh, designated for like SDIU employees, correctional officers, uh, court officers. Um, I don't want to not try to get some money, but I would not um, really count on that till it's in the bank. Uh, so my question to the manager would be, um, are you committing at the very least Four million, um, not with the caveat that well we're only going to give you three because we anticipate get a million from the state. Is it going to be allocated? And then if we do get that money um, from Opera, we can look at how we can perhaps give more to essential workers. But honestly, I don't see how we get that. So if I could ask the manager that question, Mr. Chairman. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman. Through you, Ms. Mahan. This is Mahan. Um, no, I, I think we understand it the same way. I, I don't have any uh, thoughts that the state premium pay would become available to us. So my approach to this would be that the $4 million that's currently proposed in the framework would be entirely made available um, to the town and school employees, that, and, that, and that I wouldn't be counting on any state support for them. Okay. And then I guess the Remainder of my remarks, um, again, dovetailing on Mr. Hertz. Originally, I was coming in because it was my understanding we were going to vote on only four categories. So that would bring a total of five. And I was feeling very frustrated that I didn't see APRA on there for um, essential town workers and essential um, private sector workers. Um, so I was really going to bang the drum on that. But um, Thankfully, that is there. Um, what I'm hearing is we're committed to the four million. The only way that number changes is if it goes up. Um, having said that, um, I recognize my role, my lane, um, and I think people recognize and respect that I'm going to say for, for any employee, you know, as we do with our town manager and our schedule employee when we compare their positions to comparable communities like Brookline and Lexington, which also has a lot of business tax, um, they're either at the top or the top um, of what their peers are being paid. And I have the same dedication I have to that. I also have to, to town employees. And that's why um, I really wanted the 4.7 million because two people who I spoke in town government who I trust, uh, quoted a figure is of it might be almost 5 million. So, and then somebody else told me it's about 4.7. So that's why I'm pushing for that. So I'll keep doing that. And um, yes, I was proud to have joined the chairman, Mr. DeCourcy, who also gave remarks and distributed the proclamation along with Mr. Hurd. We had uh, Representative Gobbley representing the legislative delegation. Well, we did not have, and I did not know until I went into the Crown Plaza ballroom, less than 100 people, more than socially distanced, firefighter party, retirement party that's happened every year for, I think someone said 46 or, or more. Also had a representative from the PFFM District 6 who told a very nice story about Chief Jefferson that really summarized his character. When I walked in, and you, you have to understand this event, a firefighter family, if you're associated with one, you get what this night is. This is a night that's a little bittersweet. This is a night that you're happy if the person's going out and still has their health, and some don't. This is a night where the families come in and they talk about it 
at family events, they talk, I've gone to wakes where I've seen proclamations out from, you know, and I remember saying, you know, you deserve so much more. Um, and they talk about, believe it or not, all town employees, um, spouses and families know the top cat or dog is the town manager. So when every table came in and brought their families for retirement, I walked in, there's the town hall table reserved. Nobody's there. Um, normally, uh, previous town managers, um, I didn't serve with Don Marquis, so I don't know. Uh, I believe Brian Sullivan, I remember him not being invited initially, but he may have at the end. But one of the things that I was always impressed with, and it's, and it's known that if the town manager doesn't go, a designee or designees in his steed goes instead. Um, normally we have Mr. Chapterling, Mr. Pooler, Mr. Feeney. I know he's on vacation last week, Ms. Malloy, usually Ms. Bongiorno. Um, I think I saw Ms. Wright once because there was something germane. I don't expect all the department heads to go, but this is uh, an event to show your respect and your support. And it is a labor event. And to Mr. Chapdelaine and Mr. Pooler, who I'm gonna disagree um, on his remarks directed to me. Um, and I'd be happy to have a conversation with him. I've already shared it with the manager, but I understand your role and happy you wear. But Mr. Chapdelaine, Mr. Pooler, and Ms. Malloy, they are the persons we designate for our labor relations. It's not negotiations. It's not to say we'd like to give you what you're worth, but we have no money, 12 million in free cash. And to walk in there and part of the program that all the families know, and I, I'm saying this with sincere intent, not trying to take advantage of a situation. They know someone gets up from the state delegation, someone gets up from the select board and the town manager as designee gets up. And if it's not the town manager, it's something usually written remarks prepared by him. So that outright snub and sign of disrespect. And if someone tries to say to me, oh, well, we're concerned about COVID-19. I say to you, Mr. Chaplain, this is an event that I consider in your contract that you, when you receive a request by any union or non-union, you need to respond to that. If you had done maybe the man up thing to say, you know what, I'm ticked off at unions right now. So I'm, nobody's coming to find out that night that it's an empty table. Um, and to say, oh, it's COVID-19, I got asked two weeks ago by an East Arlington resident, town meeting member organized a L wife walkthrough on a Saturday morning. She contacted you, I believe emailed, and requested that you come. And I remember one of the residents said, do you really think the manager will come? And I didn't say what I wanted to say, which is no way he's down in debt and he's not committing four hours on a Saturday. What I said was, I can guarantee you, and this is how I feel about this fire event, because if I had any whiff that this was gonna happen, I would have said these remarks beforehand to try to save the insult and embarrassment these families um, had to deal with. I don't know how many times we were asked, where's the town manager? Where's the town department heads? Um, the manager did not go to that gathering of 15, 16 people for the better part of an hour and a half up and down the Alwife, but he sent the health and human service uh, director who also doesn't live in Arlington, but lives closer. And it was appropriate for her to be there. So that total snub to totally blow off, I, I feel you owe not so much the firefighters themselves, they, they're embarrassed for their family. And, and, and that's what it was. I, I mean, I heard it all night long. I didn't fan any flames. What I said was I had no idea they were all blowing it off until I showed up and you see the empty town hall reserve tables and not even Casper the Friendly Ghost was there. So um, please take that, those remarks that I'm sincere about that. I was very upset that night, very embarrassed. Um, and if you're gonna say, oh, it's COVID-19, maybe you shouldn't be in municipal employment because you're a town manager, you're a department head. Rodemach is out all the time, everywhere in the street. I try not to stop and talk to him too much. If, you know, if you're that concerned and other department heads about COVID-19, and not even checking out to find out less than 100 people, we were like 10, 12 feet apart at each table, um, that maybe this isn't the um, career for you because um, I still do my job at 3,000 a year. So I'm, I'm very upset about that. And I know 
no, I haven't beaten the dead horse, but I really wanted to get that across because I was just, if I could crawl under my chair all night, I would have done it because I was so embarrassed. So I, I hope I can get from the manager a commitment in the future that that will never happen again. Um, and there will be at least some representation and, and, and congratulations, another thing that got snubbed by town hall, there was one employee whose spouse came um, from the union. Um, she also received the Citizen of the Year Award and we know what the fire department has meant to her and her family and what they've done for her. And so, um, you know her, she's like, ah, I don't give a, you know what, it rolls off my back, but you know what, I think people do care and I didn't appreciate that slight either. Thank you. I don't know if the manager wants to say anything or just, yeah, I, I, I'm going to do, do, I don't know if you want to say something, Mr. Chaplin, or. Well, Mr. DeCourcy, I, it's not, I mean, I, I would refer, defer to you as it's not at all in the scope of the agenda yeah. item. Okay, um, now I'm going to pull this card because I, I, I want no, no, to. Excuse no, me no, just a second. Let me tell you why, Mr. DeCourcy, because twice you have cut me off. Um, as, as this is attempting now, and I had a conversation with you a month ago on Friday night about the fact that these meetings were going well past 11 into midnight. And I pointed out when we had the mass in Appleton, I said, you know, I'm going to say you can't talk about that because it's not on the agenda or it's, it's, yeah, it's in there, it's kind of broad. And what you said to me is, and you haven't done this with my other colleagues, you said, well, I don't like to cut any select member board off. They have a right to say what they're going to say. I know that's your style, but I leave it up to the individual member. So I would like that same courtesy. Are you talking to me, Mrs. Mahan? Yes, I would like Mr. to you, Mr. Chapdelaine's remarks to that. If, if he cares to respond, but I, I, I you know, I, I allowed you, you to talk, you know, you have the right, as I say to you, you have the right to talk on these issues. It's, you made your opinion felt. Um, if Mr. Chapdelaine wishes to respond, you can respond. If he wants to talk offline to you about it, he can talk offline to you about it. I do think this is an opera discussion. I understand um, we heard your concerns and, and the fact that you're upset about this. Um, I personally, I, I went to the event. I know there are reasons why people didn't go to the event. I'm going to respect their choices on that. And I think it's something, frankly, that is better talked about offline, um, perhaps between the two of you and, 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 and in terms of what the issues were and what the considerations were, rather than have the board um, talk about it during the meeting tonight. I'm sorry, that's the way I feel about it, given where we are on this discussion. If Mr. Chapdelaine would like to talk, respond tonight, he can. If he doesn't want to, he doesn't have to uh, on, on, on that point. But I think this right. is something that I, I think, to be honest with you, I mean, again, you, you expressed the concern. I was there with you the other night. I, I, I did go, but I'm not going to put him on the spot to say why you didn't go or what, what your consideration I know, but was. You but have to you respect are... I'm the senior member on the board. I should be afforded no, the same that. opportunity. I do, just because you want to give him the luxury or, or whatever, saying you don't have to respond. I say, I want a response and he, I want a response from him. And whatever that response is, it is what it is. But I know a lot of town employees watch these meetings um, and if you want to declare the air or whatever, but I just I want a response to why the town manager and his department heads in town hall all snubbed that event that traditionally has gone to and uh, a commitment that that won't happen again. Or if it is, at least give people a heads up. Yeah, I, and, and again, I, I, I don't want to delay the meeting a long time here. This is an opera discussion. It's not a discussion about what happened at the, at the firefighters retirement party. And I think, to be honest with you, and and uh, you know, it's my meeting to run in terms of what's within scope and what isn't. You made your point, I, I and and I think that's fine to make the point. I think this is something that if the manager wants to respond tonight, he can. That's he fine. Doesn't, that's he fine. doesn't have that's to. Fine. That's okay. fine. But when Mr. But, I mean, Hurd brought it, up it, the fire department party, he was not cut off. He was allowed to talk, and because it wasn't making off. it wasn't making people uncomfortable. Sometimes. You need to be uncomfortable to fix things and make it better. But we're going back and forth. I would like to hear from the manager. He can give he can he, give me his best. He can respond, Mrs. Mahan. I'm hand. gonna cut you I off right care. now for a second because I didn't cut you off either. Okay. I allowed you to speak. I allowed you to talk about the party. Frankly, it's not within the within the scope. I allowed you to go on. 
you asked the question. I'll turn to Mr. Chaplin. If he wants to answer right now, he can answer right now. If he would prefer to, to reach out to you, I'll allow him to do that. But I, I can't go, can't go back and forth on this issue right now. You made your point. I didn't cut you off when you were making your point and when you, when you spoke. So I don't think it's fair to say you didn't cut Mr. Hurd off and now you're cutting me off because I allowed you to finish. Okay, the last so thing that, I said, Mr. I, I would like if to you hear were, from the manager and you- I'm gonna turn to Mr. Go Chapter back and now, forth. Mrs. Mahan. Mr. Chapdelaine, if you would like to respond now, you, you can, um, I'd leave it to you. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I, I, I will respond uh, briefly to the concerns raised by Mrs. Mahan. Uh, in terms of the firefighters retirement banquet, I made a very hard decision um, to not go based on concerns about COVID. Um, I, I've made, I've unfortunately gone, I've not gone to a few things that would have otherwise been very important to me over the course of the past several months based on a decision that I've made that I'm not going to go to events like that until my two children are vaccinated. And I, I frankly respect everyone's decisions around COVID and I would expect the same of mine. I don't judge people for doing certain things and I don't judge people for not doing certain things. I think I've attended every firefighter retirement banquet since I started for the town as deputy town manager. It's an event I greatly enjoy attending and it was a really hard decision to not go last Friday and I, I, I regret that it was a decision that had to be made and I wish I could have been there. Um, I, I don't understand the accusation of um, a snub without letting anybody know that's not factual or accurate, um, but I do, um, it was a very painful, hard decision for me because I care deeply about our firefighters, their families and the work they do for the town. In regard to the event, the Ale Wife Brook, I believe you also suggested that I was unresponsive to that request, which is also not the case. I responded that on Saturday morning, I was preoccupied uh, bringing my children to their soccer games, but that I would be very happy to meet with the advocates around that issue and bring whichever members of the town staff would be necessary to help them figure out the right ways to advocate for concerns being expressed about combined sewer overflows into the LOF Brook. Um, so I, I think the accusations of lack of responsiveness are unfounded. Um, and I generally, back to the firefighters banquet, it was a hard decision, um, but and again, until my children are vaccinated, it's not nothing specific to the firefighters. Um, any event like that, I won't be going to. Okay. Thank you, Mr. Chaplin. I'm gonna move on. Um, as I said, we're gonna take public comment on this. Um, I will reserve comments in, until after we hear from, from the public. Uh, Mr. Chaplin, is there anybody who has their hand raised? Elizabeth Dre has her hand raised. Okay. Good evening, Ms. Dre. Good evening, thank you, Elizabeth Dre. Um, I it will be very quick just to say how thrilled I am to have seen the equity outreach um, position and inclusive, inclusive of translation services. Uh, it's been an issue that's been very close to my heart that I've been very vocal about in town over the last couple of years. And I'm absolutely thrilled, really thrilled to see that there. And I just wanted to say thank you. Thank you, Mr. All right, is there anybody else who wishes to speak? There are no other hands raised right now, Mr. DeCourcy. Okay, as I said, I will return to the board um, and I will go in the same order, Mr. Helmuth. Thank you, I'd like to move approval of the town manager's uh, draft vote as written. And, um, you know, I just need to say that I think it is entirely uh, within the scope of, of exemplary town manager performance 
to do exactly what our town manager has decided to do. And frankly, I don't think it is appropriate to second guess anyone's health decisions about COVID. I am embarrassed that this happened tonight. I think it is a poor use of the public's time and money. And I'm glad that the town manager took the opportunity to explain, even though he shouldn't have had to, his personal decisions. We do not need to be talking about insults as if we are enemies and at each other's throats. We are all on the same team. We all value immensely the contributions that our public servants and our first responders make. And I hope that the citizens of Arlington understand uh, that we have a town manager and a staff who are fair and value the contributions of everybody. And, you know, frankly, I don't think that browbeating the town manager over a specific incident in the middle of a pandemic is, is appropriate to the dignity of this body and certainly not a good use of the public's time. So I'm not gonna spend any more time discussing that, but I needed to say it. And uh, on the positive side, as I said before, I think that the ARPA framework that we're voting on is a really fair representation of this community's values. It values our first responders, our teachers, but it values the less fortunate among us. It values our public health, our mental health, our infrastructure. There's so much more in ARPA than premium pay. And I think that that has gotten short shrift when we've gone a bit afield of that. So uh, I, I encourage the public to, to look at the document, to reflect upon it, to think about how it reflects their values and to stay in touch with us about that because this is a work in progress. So again, I'm happy to move to support the town manager's uh, budget. I think um, I'm open to what my colleagues think, but, but to Mr. Hurd's uh, suggestion, my preference would be to not ask in this vote for the town manager to come back to us for specific uh, approvals on the premium pay. I think only because it could make it difficult to get that done in a timely manner. And I'm not sure speaking for myself that I want to be involved at that granular level. I think there comes a time where we need to let the town manager and the staff kind of do the good faith work that they do in the broader context of all the other negotiations they do with our workers. Um, so personally, I'm comfortable just voting this as is, um, but you know, respectful of my colleagues' thoughts on that as well. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Okay, thank you, Mr. Helmuth. Uh, Mr. Diggins. Thank you, Mr. Chair. I will second that motion. And um, uh, I guess to, with respect to whether uh, to come back to the board, I mean, I mean, my understanding is that you, Mr. Chair, are in touch with me with the town manager regularly. I mean, so I think that uh, you can stay on top of it. Uh, and, and if anything you, know, you feel should be brought uh, to the board, you'll do so in a timely manner so that if we need to feedback and make some adjustments, we can do so. So I'll trust you on that one. And, and um, um, it's, um, it sure is an interesting board. And uh, so um, that's all, thank you. Okay, just, just one point on that, Mr. Diggins. And, and I think if we vote the way we're doing it, we're basically authorizing the town manager to, to conduct things. So I, I'm not planning on, I'm not gonna call it intervening, but I mean, in, in terms of, he came to me and said, I wanna come back to the board, absolutely. But I think um, what Mr. Hurd was saying, do we wanna have that additional step? Mr. Helmuth feels that, that it, probably best to have Mr. Chapter Lane um, do the best that he can. So I appreciate your comments, but I think depending on, on the vote tonight, I'm, I'm not going to step in and say, okay, um, I, I, I want more input on a particular issue absent Mr. Chapter Lane coming to me, depending on how we vote tonight. So I just want to be clear on that. Right. I understand. And, 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 okay. and, and I, I appreciate that. And so I'm, I'm going to stand by, I mean, um, uh, I mean, I'm, I'm going to be in agreement with um, Mr. Helmuth being, uh, I was thinking of kind of the relationship that and I, I have with the chair where I kind of, I touch base on a lot of things on a regular basis. I mean, so this would be one where I would be touching base and, and, and if I felt that I mean, something should be brought to the board, then I would be, it would be like two people that could determine whether or not something comes back to the board. It would be the, the town manager and myself you're choosing not to do that, and that's fine. Uh, uh, and, and so I will stick with um, 
I, I will agree with Mr. Hellman in really the interest of time and, 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 and trust. So is that clear, Mr. Chair? Yeah, yeah, no, and, and I'm saying that, not that I'm not choosing to do it. I, I, I wanna follow what the board's preferences, uh, you know, through what Mr. Helmuth expressed. And I think you're in agreement with, with Mr. Helmuth on, on that. And if there's a need, any member, if we need more clarification can ask for it. But I, I, I just didn't want it to be left open that this is gonna be um, some sort of discussion between Mr. Chapterline and I after we vote in terms of what, what a particular decision is gonna be. If we vote this, it's, it's, we're basically saying to him, okay, um, we're entrusting this to you and, and um, you know, if there's a need to come back, you come back to us. Right, uh, Mr. Chair, okay. I totally Sorry, We might that. be on the same page. And, yeah, and yes, just, yeah, we are. Thanks for the clarification. Okay, okay. Mr. Hurd. Sorry to complicate things. And I'm 100% fine with Eric's motion, Mr. Helmuth's motion. Um, and, you know, like, like you said, we've had these discussions and Mr. Chaplin is in each situation adjusted the figure to what our recommendations were. So he is certainly shown that he's following the board's wishes on particularly premium pay. So I can just follow up with Mr. Chapelet and maybe have a request that not it come from this board, but maybe we can have a discussion once you figure out the, um, the parameters. I'll just give you my thoughts just as, as one board member, as opposed to coming back back up for any sort of approval and I'll trust your your judgment as far as how the breakdown will go. So and that's I'm certainly comfortable with that. And you know we we, do, we have talked a lot about premium pay because out of the original um, figures that are proposed to us, that's just one figure that I had personally thought that was not given enough allocation. I didn't don't want to detract from the many, many other categories that are going to receive the benefit of the ARPA funds. And I think we can do amazing things with the $36 million that's been allocated to us. And, um, you know, I think we have the right person administering it. And I look forward to where we are in four years after we make the investments that we need to in the town. So I'm happy to support the motion. Thank, thank you, Mr. Hurd. Mrs. Mahan. Bet you all will hope that my mute bucket button would stay st stuck, but it worked. Sorry about that. Um, I agree with um, what Mr. Hurd and, and the chair and, and Mr. Diggins have spoken about. What I and I don't want to interject, slow down the process, make it more laborious than it needs to be. <clears throat> but what I would like is after um, I would like the parameters and formula formula for our town workers and private sector workers, you know, what the formula is, um, what the definition of an essential worker is, whether public or private, is it someone who had no option of working at home at all, which a lot of people think that's what it is. Um, you know, not somebody that, you know, came in one or two days a week and worked two or three days at home. Um, so what I'd like is after everything's been discussed and agreed upon, and I'm not looking for like a 12 or three page, well, maybe three, but four page, I, I want, you know, this is, the, this is a definition of essential workers we use for private or public. Um, this is approximately uh, with the funding we have, um, with the formula, if it can be provided, that says, um, not just if you came into work every day, if there's a salary cap, um, and you were, if you were an essential worker who came in every day, but whatever the manager, the unions, Ms. Malloy and or Mr. Pooler decides, um, I'd just like to know that. I, I don't need to know, you know the exact number, um, you know, Jane Doe and John Doe got it. Um, I just wanna know ultimately descriptors, the formula, descriptors of what was agreed upon that you applied to the formula and that's it. So it, I'm not, you know, it probably could be on a page for me and I'll leave it to the chair, whether that's uh, on a, a, an agenda item at a board meeting or whether it's something the town manager or somebody as his designee emails to all of us. Um, Cause I'm, I'm, I'm not the one to say if something should be 
an agenda item, but, I, but I'm happy with if I've encapsulated what it is I'm looking for. I'm not looking for anything more than a one max two page thing that says that. Um, and I, the manager misheard me. I did not say you were not responsive to the alwife. I said you were. Um, Ms. Bongiorno was there. Um, and to my colleague, Mr. Helmuth, uh, who took personal offense um, about me taking, I guess, shots at the manager's um, health decisions. My point was that there are certain events that I expect the town manager to be there. And if he can't pick one person that every single department had shared that same concern, which I do respect, um, I would have expected at the very least a letter from the town manager to be read at the meeting. You know, he doesn't have to go into his family decisions. Or, you know, well, he has here publicly. <clears throat> so if, if people heard, because he's very concerned, justifiably so, for his two young children, and as well as no other department had he contacted wanted to come to this event either. As a matter of respect, they're expecting to hear from the town manager. That was my point. There should have been a letter with remarks that the police, oh, sorry, fire chief or Chief Jefferson, who personally ran this event. Um, so I'll leave it at that. And I'm happy to support. And I do want to thank the manager from starting off for premium pay for public employees, town employees. When I saw, I saw the 1.267 million, I think was the initial number, just to get a number on the table, um, to have come up to the 4 million is a great improvement. And I am appreciative of it. And once again, people, please just respect. I fight this hard for all of our town employees and our residents, as you all do. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Uh, thank, thank you, Mrs. Mahan. And so just a couple of things. And again, this is from, to your request, and I'm sure the manager um, can can put that together um, in terms of when he's completed what the what the parameters are. But to your specific point on essential workers, and and I'm going to read again from the interim final rule, and and it says to ensure that premium pay is targeted to workers that face or faced or face heightened risks due to the character of their work. The interim final rule defines essential work as work involving regular in-person interactions or regular physical handling of items that are also handled by others. That's a definition that's in the rule, I think there's a rule definition in the statute. So that's because any amounts expended are subject to audit, I, that that I would imagine is gonna be the rule that's gonna be followed. I see attorney Heim nodding his head uh, on, on that point. So, I mean, I think it, it is in the rule. There is some additional challenges when we do get to private pay because I think that has to be done through a grant that employers actually have to apply for. So it, it is tricky in terms of um, how, the, how the workers are, are identified, but I appreciate that being separated out. Um, just a couple more comments. I mean, colleagues have, have covered um, mostly everything in here, but on the, on the housing authority, um, a question for Mr. Chapelain. We, we already have two requests from the housing authority, we may have a third. And I'm wondering if it doesn't make sense to go back and maybe ask the housing authority to consolidate their requests just to make it a little easier in terms of what's being sought. Thank you, Mr. I, I like that idea. Um, yeah, I, I think going in, you know, figuring out the proper audience either with the acting executive director or perhaps even with the housing authority board makes sense. Um, I mean, I, I, I don't, sit here tonight opposed to giving the housing authority more than what's spelled out on the framework tonight and you know and then getting the board's endorsement of that at a future meeting but i think you're right i think having sort of a comprehensive discussion with the housing authority makes very good sense okay and 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 i appreciate your comments earlier on the um the chamber of commerce because that that request has come in and i know you'll take a look at it and if did there may be um in some areas of that request where there's already funds being being allocated and, and um, it, it sounds like you're going to get back to them and and see what can be done there so that sounds that sounds fine to me so i i will support the the motion seems like we're on the same page on this one um so a on a motion by mr helmuth seconded by mr diggins um i'll turn to attorney Hyde. mr hurd yes mr diggins yes mr helmuth 
Mrs. Mahan? Yes. Mr. DeCourcy? Yes. It's, it's unanimous vote. Okay, thank you. Um, so I, it, it's 940 now. I think I think we could use a couple minute break um, if members would, uh, I know we've got a lot on our plate, but I think maybe a five minute break is in order. And what I'd like to do when we return, um, we had, I'm, I'm going a lot out of order tonight, but I, I had told the Place Advisory Board Study Committee that I hope to get them on by 8.30. Um, it's now 9.40. So when we come back, I'd like to go to that and then head back in the, um, in the agenda and, and uh, try to wrap things up by 11. So um, why don't we take a five minute break and then we will come back uh, if it's okay with board members with item number 10. Okay, good. All right, thank you. Okay, I believe we are all back. So welcome back to the select board meeting. Uh, I'm now skipping to item 10, presentation and receipt, police advisory board study committee interim report. Susan Ryan Vollmer, co-chair, Laura Gittleson, co-chair, both of the Civilian Police Advisory Board Study Committee, and Carlos Morales, member of the Civilian Police Advisory Board Study Committee. And um, we're gonna receive the report. And there are also, um, I'm sure it will be mentioned during the report while we're waiting for them to come up. Um, the study committee will be having a, the full study committee will be having a session on October 27th to seek the public's input. They'll also be having smaller focus groups on Tuesday, November 4th and Saturday, November 13th. The links to that are on the town's website. Um, so the study committee had asked to present their interim report, report to us and to also let the public know about the upcoming forum. So I will uh, now turn it over to the committee and um, I don't know, Ms. Gilson, are you gonna be making the presentation? Yes, thank you. Sure. Thank you for being here tonight and thank you for waiting. Thank you. Um, thank you for inviting us to give an update on our work. Uh, my name is Laura Gittleson and I am the co-chair of the Civilian Police Advisory Board Study Committee, which was created by the 2020 Special Town Meeting. The charge of the study committee is straightforward. We have been asked to consider alternative ways for residents to file complaints about police interactions, to study whether Arlington would benefit from a police civilian review board, and to study how recent changes to state law regarding public safety and policing might affect the town of Arlington. I am going to give you a brief summary of what we have learned to date. And then I'm going to turn things over to study committee member Carlos Morales for an overview of the models of civilian oversight. The study committee has met 11 times since March 19th. We have heard from outside experts as well as our talented town staff in an effort to help us understand the issues related to our charge from town meeting. These experts have included Pittsfield Police Chief Michael Wynn, who is one of Governor Charlie Baker's three appointees to the Massachusetts Peace Officer Standards and Training Commission, known as the Post Commission, which was created as part of the state's new public safety law. Chief Wynn shared insights into the process of standing up the Post Commission and how that is likely to affect individual towns and cities. He also shared his experiences over many years of trying to build political support to get a civilian advisory board created in Pittsfield. We also heard from Brian Kaur, who is the immediate past president of the National Association for Civilian Oversight of Law Enforcement. Brian is also the executive secretary for Cambridge's Police Review and Advisory Board. Brian shared that in his experience, the most effective oversight often looks like a partnership between police and community members. We learned from Brian that there are just over 200 civilian advisory boards in communities across the country, and that most of them have been created in just the last 10 years in response, mostly in reaction to negative interactions between residents and police. Since the summer of 2020 and the murder of George Floyd, another 200 communities have been proactively working with Brian and the National Association to explore ways to bring civilian oversight to their communities. Many more like Arlington are studying the issue. 
Other experts who've shared information with us include Arlington Town Council Doug Heim, who presented on the ways that the state's new public safety law might affect Arlington. Sandy Pooler and Karen Malloy presented on how advisory committees might affect collective bargaining with police unions. Police Chief Julie Flaherty has provided the study committee with complaint data for the last several years and presented to the committee about the work of APD's Professional Standards Unit. In addition, she has been extremely generous in providing context for these data and is sharing her expertise in policing and public safety with us. Director of Diversity, Equity, and Inclusion, Jill Harvey, presented on the ways she has supported residents of Arlington who had experienced negative reactions with police, but were afraid to bring their concerns to the department. Director Harvey also shared with the study committee her observation, which is based on her experience working in Arlington and meeting twice a month with other municipal DEI professionals, that Arlington is not unique in being home to people, such as the residents she has worked with who have a lack of trust in police. This is a problem that exists in every city and town in the state. And Director Harvey was clear in stating that this is not a reflection on the professionalism of the police officers who work in Arlington or the leadership of Chief Julie Flaherty. If you have not yet, I encourage you to read her entire memo to the study committee, which is on our website. We have also engaged in our own study of civilian police advisory boards. We've learned that in addition to Pittsfield, Cambridge, Springfield, and Boston also have permanent advisory boards. Like Arlington, the towns of Lexington, Newton, and Brookline, and the cities of Somerville and Lynn are studying whether civilian police advisory boards would be appropriate for their communities. In our research, we have learned that Lexington has had to confront the, real, real, the reality that some black police officers experience racism on the part of the town's mostly white population. Finally, we have studied in depth the various models of civilian advisory boards that most communities put in place. I'm going to turn things over now to Carlos Morales, who will outline for you what these models look like. Thank you. Good evening. As Ms. Gilson said, I will give you a brief overview of the model of civilian oversight. The first, the first model that we'll cover today is the so-called investigative model. This type of board has the authority to investigate individual complaints filed by members of the public. It has the power to subpoena witnesses and documents and hold hearings in public as well as in executive session. It operates independently of the local police department and sometimes even replaces the department's internal affairs unit. Many people, when they think of civilian oversight of police, they have in their head this type of board. But however, there are many other models that the community can implement. <clears throat> so I, as, as it was already mentioned, we heard from Brian Core, a nationally recognized expert on civilian oversight of police. Brian explained to us that the investi investigative model sometimes is kind of like an adversarial approach to civilian oversight. And it has largely fallen out of favor in place with more proactive models of civilian oversight that build partnerships with law enforcement and help law enforcement build bridges with, wide, with the wider part of the community. The next three models I will discuss fall into that proactive category. So the next model I wanna talk about is this auditor monitor focus model. This model evaluates the processes by which police misconduct complaints are submitted and it assesses the thoroughness and fairness of the investigative process used to address complaints. The key strengths of this model includes being able to ensure fairness and consistency in disciplinary, disciplinary investigations and outcomes, and making it much easier for the members of the public to understand the complaints process and to ac access the data that improves the transparency and enhances community police relations. For this model to work though, it is helpful for people appointed to the oversight board and, and committees to have some professional expertise in the areas of the committee that the areas of the committee is auditing and monitoring. The next model we have learned about is the review focus model. As its name suggests, this model reviews the quality of internal investigations, particularly those conducted by internal affairs units. Civilian boards that use the review model typically receive complaints from the community, assess the quality of already completed policing internal affairs investigations, advocate to town and police officials for further review on investigation, 
and hold public meetings to gather information and review and report on issues of public concern about local police activity or absence of police response. This model is typically far less independent than the other models that we talked about. And the opportunity is to ensure that actions are taken that will increase transparency and build trust between residents and police can be sometimes lost. The final model that we'll mention today is the hybrid model. And as it sounds, this model is, uh, is hybrid in the sense that at the community would pick and choose qualities of the investigative, auditor, or review models that are most appropriate to their own communities. The hybrid model is increasingly common among newer civilian oversight agencies for two reasons. First, the overall discussion, discussion on law enforcement reform and accountability has turned to us proactive prevented efforts in the root causes of problems between residents and police, in addition to addressing individual instances of misconduct. Second, when the perspective of many community members are included in the process, the recommended actions end up balancing the needs of more st stakeholders, which requires compromise in addition to creativity. And with this, I pass it back to Ms. Gilson. Sorry, I unmuted myself. We, thank you, Carlos. Um, we are currently in the listening phase of our work, briefing the committees that were appointing authorities, appearing here to you, holding a large open forum, that's the one on Wednesday that uh, Mr. DeCourcy mentioned, and forum and smaller ones. We've invited residents of public housing, members of the faith and religious community, BIPOC residents, town employees, veterans, members of the immigrant community, members of the LGBTQIA plus community, students and parents of students from Arlington Public Schools, and members of the Arlington Police Department to small group meetings to make sure that the committee receives input from the many different stakeholders who live and work in Arlington. Following these meetings, the committee will get down to the work of building recommendations for the town. We appreciate that town meeting has entrusted our committee with this difficult and important work. The town employees on our committee, Town Council Heim, DEI Director Harvey and Chief Flaherty have been invaluable contributors to our work. And we have appreciated their generosity in sharing their time and expertise with us. There is still much to be done, but I have been impressed by the seriousness and dedication that all of the committee members have brought to the task. We look forward to sharing more with you in the coming months. Great. Thank you very much, Ms. Gibson and, and Mr. Morales. Um, so I will now turn it to the board um, and I will start with Mrs. Mahan. Excuse me. Thank you, Mr. Chair. First, I'd like to uh, move receipt. Um, I want to thank um, Ms. Gittleson, Mr. Morales, and Ms. Ryan Volmar um, for all the work that they put to date and are committing to continue with uh, moving forward. Um, Ms. Um, Ryan Volmar did reach out to me um, and asked if uh, we could meet for about an hour, which um, she was kind enough to let it go to about an hour and a half plus. And she asked very direct questions um didn't hold any punches but you know but, but basic questions about you know what the committee should be what i view it is maybe um to go back and forth and put on the table what i think and then um and we had some uh commonality there uh in terms of uh the discussion we had um so you definitely um have been doing a lot in the listening phase <laughs> Uh, and and we'll continue to do so. So um, um, thank you to everyone, and please pass on my thanks to the rest of the committee. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Thank you, Mrs. Mahan. Uh, Mr. Hurd. I will second Mrs. Mahan's motion and just thank all the presenters and all the committee workers and all the town staff that supported the committee for all your work. It seems to be a work in progress. I'm glad to hear that you receive public comment and um, certainly have thoughts on this issue, but since this is a town meeting created committee and I'm a town meeting member, I'll address my thoughts at the more appropriate time. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Hurd. Mr. Diggins. 
Thank you, Mr. Chair. I mean, I've been impressed by um, what you all have been doing and, 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 and the way in which you all collaborate. In, and, and I suggest anyone who's interested in, to check out the webpage that they have, because all the recordings I mean, of, their, um, of their meetings are there and lots of other good materials. So, um, so yeah, this is what I really hope would come out of a, a study group, because you know, regardless of whether you want something to happen or not, it, um, it, at least initially, a lot of things are worth studying, and in the process, I mean, you you learn a lot, you know, uh, and and if nothing else, I mean, you learn how to work together, and and not that the folks in this committee needed to learn how to work together, but I think I mean, they are working together in in such a a a, a wonderful way, um, and 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 so I'm I'm proud of what they are doing. Um, if you don't mind, you know, I have uh, uh, four short questions. Or and you can give really brief answers to them, okay? Um, and they may be so detailed that you don't know the answer. That's fine. On, on page four, you say um, there's a uh, there's a list of items there, and one I think towards the bottom is to reduce legal liability from officer misconduct. I didn't quite understand that. I mean, I would have thought that it would have been increased. I mean, so uh, I'm sure you're right, but can you just explain what that means? I'm sorry, I don't actually have the report in front of me. Okay, that's um, fine. That's so I'm not looking, I don't, can't see exactly where you that's where quite you're right. referencing, but yes. if you, I'm happy to talk about it some Later on. other time. <laughs> that's fine, that's fine. So then maybe one that that um, we don't need to refer to, um, uh, but it is a, a, a detail. Um, it was that um, the, in the six years being, um, Hold on a second. The town's approximately, oh, okay. Yeah, during, we have 60 police officers and in the six years from 2016 to 2021, there have been 18 citizens complaints, which strikes me as pretty low, but do you know how that compares to other towns of our size? No, unfortunately we don't have com comparable data there. Okay, um, and one, one final question. Do you know if any of those um, um, 18 events revo involve repeated the same officer i do not know we don't okay. have the details of the events okay fine that's it thank you thank you mr diggins uh, mr helmuth thank you mr chair thank you very much uh to the study committee i have been impressed that how hard you're working how hard you are listening and how much how hard you're learning uh, I also enjoyed, like my colleague, Ms. Mahana, enjoyed my sit down with, with Ms. Ryan Volmar. I also enjoyed, uh, he's not studying anything, but Sanjay Newton did a really great interview with ACMI um, a little while ago, and I enjoyed watching that. And, uh, and I've, I, I enjoyed learning. I'm learning along with, I think, the rest, rest of us um, about all the different ways that this could look and all the pros and the cons. And um, I think I, I, I'm glad Mr. Hurd made his points that, you know, this is a committee of town meeting, and I think that we, I want to respect that. Uh, prerogative as well, uh, but I encourage you to keep doing that. I, I encourage the public to uh, to tune in on Wednesday evening at seven, I think, for your meeting where, where you're inviting uh, the public to comment. Um, it's one of the great things about Arlington government. We really do listen. Um, comments really are recorded, thought about, summarized, um, and it makes a difference. So I encourage, uh, encourage residents to do that. And, uh, and thanks, keep up the good work. I look forward to uh, hearing how the, the second half of your, uh, your year goes. Thank, thank you, Mr. Helmuth. I also wanna echo uh, my colleagues' comments and, and, and thank Ms. Ryan Volmer. She met with me as well and, and we had a, a nice meeting in, in Arlington Center and, and um, she asked a lot of questions and, and uh, they, they, we had a very good discussion. So I really appreciate the, um, all, all the work you're doing, the, the, the reaching out. I, I, had received a report through a council on aging meeting that I attended. And, and I really think it's great that you're reaching out to the various committees that, that, that uh, to the extent that you have members, I know there was a presentation at, at the board of youth services meeting. So it, it's, it's great outreach um, that you're doing. And, and uh, just as you said, the, the um, on the 27th, you're looking for more public input and, and, uh, People can find the link to that on the town website and on your page, as, as well as to your meeting. So thank thank you for the work you're doing, and thank you for coming in tonight to give us an update. Thank you. Um, okay, with that, I, we have a motion to receive by Mrs. Mahan that was seconded by Mr. Hurd, Attorney Heim. I take motion on committee that I'm on. 
Oh, we're having a little trouble hearing you, Mr. Heim. Mr. Hurd? Yes. Mr. Diggins? Yes. Mr. Mr. Helmuth? Yes. Sorry, I, my, my internet connection is unstable, folks. I apologize. Uh, Mrs. Mahan? Yes. Mr. DeCourcy? Yes. It's unanimous vote. Great. Thank you very much, and, and, and thank you for uh, waiting to come on, as I said. Uh, we'll, we'll try to get you on earlier next time. Okay, so now we we really need a score sheet here. Um, we're going to go back to item number five, which is a proclamation for the Junior High West Audison Middle School Centennial anniversary. I'll read the proclamation and the, the board is so inclined to uh, look for a vote of approval. Um, and I, I, before I do that, Mr. Chapter, I don't think there's anybody on from the Audison. Um, what would, uh, what's the name involved with it, Mr. DeCourcy? I'll just um, uh, think, is it, a, it might be Amy Duke, that, that was one of the individual, we don't have the I don't see I that. I don't think there is. No, I don't believe yeah. there is. Okay. All right. So I'll, I'll, I'll read the proclamation. Um, whereas the Junior High West Audison Middle School was established as a school in 1921 to educate the children of Arlington. And whereas the Junior High West Audison community continues to provide a safe, challenging, and nurturing school environment. And whereas the school has for 100 years had an integral role in the development of the town's most important resource, our children, now therefore be it resolved that we, the members of the select board, commend the Junior High West Audison community <clears throat> on its centennial anniversary and ask all residents to join with us and recognize its 100 years of service to the children of Arlington. Um, I will turn to the board and I will start with a alumnus of the Audison Middle School, Mr. Hurd. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Happy to move approval of the uh, of the proclamation. Yes, I did attend seventh and eighth grade at Audison Middle School and um, had a great experience there. I, you know, I love all the teachers that I had there. Going to give a special shout out to Mr. Greco. Everyone knows Mr. Greco, and uh, he was my math teacher in eighth grade at Audison. So, so he's, he was always one of my favorites. But we really did have a lot of great. Um, memories there, great teachers, great administrative staff, and great cinnamon buns. That's what I remember about Audison Middle School. So happy to support this. Great. Thank you, Mr. Hurd. Mr. Diggins. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair. I'm, I'm happy to second this. You know, so what's the, uh, what's the mascot to any of you? Wouldn't be otters, would it? You don't know. You don't know. No. <laughs> well, they didn't have it when we were there. I think it's a bulldog. Hold up. Okay. Fine. Fine. So, well, a hundred more years. Go, Odyssey. Go. <laughs> Thank you, Mr. Diggins. Mrs. Mahan. Um, it's has it been seconded? Did Mr. Diggins second it? Mr. Diggins did second it. Okay. Well, I went to junior high east. However, and I also went to Arlington High School. But uh, one year of my junior high east was a combined program with the West. So. There were all kinds of little rhymes that would go back and forth with that. So um, while I never had Mr. Greco um, as a middle school teacher, if I did, he, he wouldn't be my favorite. He still, him and his wife continue to be. Um, so that's all I'll say. Thank you. Thank you, Mrs. Mahan. Mr. Helmuth. Thank you. I think all I'll say is, well, who needs a mascot when you have great cinnamon buttons? I mean, priorities here, right? Uh, I'm glad to learn this little bit of Arlington history. I didn't know the school had been around that long. That's that's just terrific. And I'm glad that we had a chance to observe this. Great. Thank you, Mr. Helmuth. And I am the second member of the board who went to the Audison. Uh, they didn't have cinnamon buns when I went there, Mr. Hurd. That was must have been some upgrades to the kitchen because uh, we didn't we didn't enjoy that. But um, and I also had a great education there, and and um, and uh, they have a lot of memorable teachers. I don't want to select one at the at the expense of offending others, but I, I had a really good time. And I will say that uh, watching tonight are also two. You and I were at the Audison and it changed names. 
the junior high west. Mrs. Kropelka was a graduate of the junior high west, and my mother's maybe still up watching from home, and she was a graduate as well. So uh, there's a few of us happy to support this proclamation. So on a motion by Mr. Hurd, seconded by Mr. Diggins, Attorney Heim. Mr. Hurd? Yes. Mr. Diggins? Yes. Mr. Helmet? Yes. Mrs. Mahan? Yes. Mr. DeCourcy? Yes. It's unanimous vote. Great. Thank you, Attorney Heim. Um, so now moving, moving right along, we're to the consent agenda. Uh, might be the latest that we've hit the consent agenda. Number eight, uh, a request for a permit for Veterans Day Parade, Thursday, November 11th, Jeffrey A. Chunglo, Director of Veterans Services. Number nine, request for contractor drain layer license, uh, large view plumbing and heating, Levi Pereira. Um, on the consent agenda, attorney, attorney, Mr. Hellman. Thank you, move approval. Mrs. Mahan. Second. Mr. Hurd. Um, happy to support, no comments. Uh, Mr. Diggins. Uh, same here, happy to support, no comments. Okay, and I have no comments either. So on a motion, by Mr. Helmuth, seconded by Mrs. Mahan, Attorney Hines. Mr. Hurd? Yes. Mr. Diggins? Yes. Mr. Helmuth? Yes. Mrs. Mahan? Yes. Mr. DeCourcy? Yes. It's unanimous vote. Okay. Uh, we are now to open forum. Except in unusual circumstances, any matter presented for consideration of the board shall neither be acted upon nor a decision made the night of the presentation in accordance with the policy under which the open forum was established. It should be noted that there is a three minute time limit to present a concern or a request. Uh, Mr. Chapdelaine, is there anybody who wishes to be heard on open forum? There does not appear to be. Okay, um, thank you. We will move on. Um, so we did number 10, number 11, item number 11, discussion, scope of work for organizational economic Development Plan, um, Ali Carter, Economic Development Coordinator. Good evening, Ms. Carter. Hello, how are you? Good, how are you? I'm fine, thank you. Um, in the interest of time, May I just go ahead? Okay. Absolutely, yeah. All right, thank you. Um, I'm Allie Carter, Economic Development Coordinator for the town. Thank you, as always, for having me. Um, I This is really a report to you all um, as we transition from the pandemic phase of COVID-19 to the more endemic phase of COVID-19. Um, and also, I want to say from the outset that this is meant to be a preliminary conversation tonight, just for the purpose of getting your feedback on these ideas. Um, these ideas were generated um, and discussed by the Economic Development Recovery Task Force, and all of the um, recommendations contained in the report were um, unanimous, unanimously approved by them at their um, last meeting. Um, so past several years, pandemic notwithstanding, there's been a lot of positive developments in town with regard to economic development. Um, but with the last year and a half in mind, um, we wanted to think about more that can be done to attract and retain businesses in Arlington um, with the goal of encouraging strategic alignment of committees maximizing budgetary and operational efficiencies and streamlining, stream, streamlining excuse me, um, some of our permitting and licensing processes without compromising on the quality of businesses that come to town or uh, public health and safety. Um, while the local economy remains strong, uh, commercial vacancies have increased due to the pandemic. So uh, we were we had a three percent townwide commercial vacancy rate in February 2020, and it's uh, seven percent now. So um, it did more than double. It's um, it thankfully it's not worse than that. Um, and I did attach an appendix with um, detailed vacancy report. 
So with that in mind, as the pandemic continues to affect the small business community, um, the task force and myself, we wanted to continue to find new ways to remain competitive and keep our local businesses strong and resilient. Um, so I wanted to just present some opportunities, three different ones with some recommendations. Um, the first would be to streamline the economic development related committees in town. There are currently five, um, the task force, ATED, the Battle Road Scenic Byway, um, and then committees that do economic development related work, the ACAC and um, the Arlington Commission for Arts and Culture, excuse me for my um, presumptive, presumptive use of uh, acronyms and um, the Arlington Cultural District Managing Partnership. So um, the recommendation is basically to reconstitute the ATED committee um, with representation from all these groups involved and to kind of, um, the work of the task force was very pandemic responsive. So to sort of transition that group into the ATED committee, combining the two with representation from the other committees. So the idea is that it would be an 11 member committee with four business representatives, one from each of the business districts on Mass Ave and um, someone from the, in, an industrial business um, with uh, Chamber of Commerce representative, Commission for Arts and Culture representative, Battle Road Scenic Byway representative, um, and the Arlington Cultural District. Oh, and one from the Redevelopment Board, and perhaps um, two additional representatives from ATED or the task force with um, professional expertise that was relevant. Um, so that was one thing. I'm just going to breeze through all these and then maybe we can come around at the end for comments on all of them. Is that fair, Mr. DeCourcy? That's fine. Yep. Thank you. Okay. Um, second opportunity um, would be to expedite processes for conducting business outdoors. Um, there's a lot of public support that's been documented for continuing parklets and other outdoor um, retail and restaurant activity. So I drafted a combined outdoor restaurant and retail permitting process um, that basically builds off the sidewalk permit application process that we've been using for years very successfully, but incorporates the streamlined aspects of the temporary outdoor dining license that we made for the pandemic. So it would basically have one set of regulations that had two tracks within the process where if you're um, applying for an installation that's on a sidewalk or a private parking lot, that can be um, reviewed and approved at the administrative, it, sorry, at the staff level. <laughs> I lose my words at a certain time of night. And um, then if that, so that would be sort of one track um, that would have a $50 fee, which is the same fee that we charge for a sidewalk permit application. And a secondary track would be if you wanted an installation in a parking space, something that had a parking impact, that would be a higher fee, $250 to kind of reflect the additional review through DPW, maybe the fire department. Um, and they would also have to come to the board for a hearing. Um, so that is the long and short of that one. I do wanna say um, that that particular application process that I drafted has been reviewed by um, the select board office, by the staff, Ashley, um, the Department of Health and Human Services, Inspectional Services, uh, the legal department, public works, and the fire department all reviewed and um, thought that the um, what we drafted in this final version that's presented to you is sound. Um, and then the final opportunity I thought I'd present would be to revise the policies, rules, and regulations for alcohol licenses in restaurants. Um, this is attached as Appendix C there are really specific edits in there. Um, nothing that really, um, we, if, if 
we want to dig into that tonight, I'm not sure at a later date. But the idea, most of the revisions are just, um, sorry, <laughs> some of the revisions bring regulations up to date with other town regulations that have been updated since 2015, which is the last time these were revised, like the sign. Um, there's some elements about signage in there um, that doesn't comply with our current zoning bylaw that was updated in 2019. Um, but others are aimed toward lifting some requirements on restaurants that increase their costs and operational burdens and may unintentionally at this point as the restaurant industry has uh, evolved, keep certain businesses from opening in town, including fast casual restaurants and breweries. Um, so at this point, I'll just close it out and uh, look forward to hearing your feedback or uh, questions. Thank you. Okay, thank you, Ms. Carter. I see Ms. Rate has joined us as well. Good evening, Ms. Rate. Um, just a question question before I turn it over to the, the board. So there are three different areas here where you've laid out the challenge and the, and the recommendations. Are you looking for approval on the first tour or is this more of a receipt tonight and come back to us down the road? And, and just, I did, did have some discussion with Mr. Chapterline about this in advance. I just wanna make sure that we're, we're clear what we're being asked to do tonight. It would be the latter. I would say the, the only thing if folks felt comfortable voting tonight would be on the um, outdoor retail and restaurant process. That's um, the most sort of fully vetted idea, but it, this was really just meant to be a discussion to hear some feedback and get some direction for you all from you all. Okay, th 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 thank you, Ms. Carter. I, I will turn to the board, uh, Mr. Hurd. Thank you, and thank you, Ms. Carter, for the presentation. Um, being the board designee from ATED, have you, and I think I missed the last ATED meeting, but have you spoken to the ATED members yet about reconstituting the committee? So I've spoken with several folks, but not at the actual meeting. So I yep. like to, do, that's important. And that's yep. why I wouldn't recommend a vote on that tonight. Yep. Um, there's a lot of redundant uh, folks on the task force, um, yourself, Bob Bowes, and that committee. Um, so this has been discussed for a while and some like draft versions of this have been circulated, but I think uh, um, more in-depth conversation with ATED is, is due. And I know looking at the committees that are being streamlined there, there's already members of ATED that are on ATAC and there's business owners that are on ATED. So I think it would be an easy transition, but it certainly is, like you said, something that's worth discussion at the next ATED meeting that's coming up to get their input as well. But I think um, it's certainly time to, in the development task force has been amazing unfortunately it seems like every time there's a, a meeting it conflicts with one of my work obligations so i haven't been able to get there in the last couple but i think rolling that into a ted and would um allow the task force goals to be taken up by a ted and i think that's worthwhile um so i certainly would support that once we have a discussion with the committee members um then I'm happy to support a motion. I'm, I'm happy to make a motion on with the recommendations for the expedited um, outdoor dining process. I think that's been very beneficial to the businesses um, and the people in, we generally go off the recommendation of town staff for when these, these requests came before us prior to COVID. And I think we have very able staff that can handle these requests and make sure that there's compliance with all the health and safety requirements necessary to do outdoor dining. So I am happy to make the request, uh, make the motion for that one particular item. Then on the third category, just so I'm clear, is one of the recommendations as far as food services re relative to the two drinks without food requests? Okay. No, um, it specifically gets to um, 
wait staff having to provide the to bring the alcohol to the table. Whereas if you're at a fast casual restaurant, like a Shake Shack or a Tasty Burger or something like that, you sort of order it at the counter and bring it back to the table yourself. Yeah. Um, the other thing is about silverware being a requirement and that there's other reusable kind of products that people can use or compostable, but the silverware kind of um, takes away the opportunity for like a, a brewery to provide sort of like more casual fare or something that would get served in like a basket lined with, um, you know, wax paper or something like that. Those are the main points. Yeah. Well, I'm certainly, I would be comfortable voting on that, but I, I think probably my, it's worth further discussion with some of the businesses. And I think my colleagues would want to have some further discussions as well, but, um, I think whatever we could do to promote more businesses and God, if we can get a Shake Shack, that'd be beautiful. But <laughs> I think my kids would certainly appreciate that. But like I said, you know, for both our current businesses and attracting new businesses, whatever we can do to make common sense changes to promote new businesses in town, I would support. So thank you for the presentation and look forward to working further on this. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Hurd. Uh, Mr. Helmuth. Thank you. I, I'm afraid I must disagree with my colleague, Mr. Hurd. I'm really more of a Tasty Burger fan, so uh, so count put put me down for that. So, uh, thank you, Ms. Carter. Um, I, I think I, I am I'm really happy to see such thought and proactivity being put into um, streamlining the, the outdoor dining and the parklets. I think, by the way, just as a side note, the work that you and your department have done for the parklets has been wonderful. Um, and I was very happy to see the really beautiful ones that just got put in um, outside of um, favorite place to get tacos. And, um, you know, it's just really, 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 really nice. And um, I think it's just a really great response to support the businesses, but it's also a new thing for the public uh, to really just enhance our enjoyment. So, uh, so I think that's great. And uh, regarding the third, and a happy, uh, I'll second Mr. Hurd's motion, by the way. So I'll second the motion. And um, regarding the third point, um, yeah, I, I'm happy to contemplate that as well. I think, I'm sure you'll do this, but uh, I want to make sure that our public health department has, you know, weighs in fully on the changes to alcohol service and, um, you know, just to make sure that we're not, that there aren't unintentional consequences that would, you know, diminish the, the protections against uh, for, for good safe alcohol service but but you know that said I think it's that we didn't when those regulations are written they probably didn't co contemplate compostable tableware um, and there's an environmental concern there too you know I think that's fine and um, it certainly didn't contemplate food trucks so it's probably time to take another look at that and you know and think about what kind of economic development we can do while still maintaining good you know sensible evidence-driven public health approaches to alcohol service. So uh, yeah, so thank you for the work and I look forward to hearing more about it. Thank you. I do wanna to note too that I've shared, uh, you know, preliminary, I've, I've shared drafts of this with APD as well, but yeah. I wanna have yeah. more conversations with them as well. Excellent, yes, good, good, yeah. Thank you, Mr. Helmuth. Mrs. Mahan. Um, thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, when you do come back next, um, unless it's the two changes or items that Ms. Carter discussed with Mr. Hurd <clears throat> for the policy rules and regulations of alcohol licenses for restaurants. Um, if it's anything outside of that, um, it, if we could get like a red line highlight version that, you know, it shows, you know, this is what you have for first offense, second offense, third offense, and then a little strikeout or brackets and then say, this is what would bring us up to date with current policies of the cities and towns, um, especially around um, the all alcohol and, and alcohol licenses. I just wanna make sure that um, if there are cases where the board perhaps did a little more stringent um, enforcement that we don't drop back down unless a majority or all, all of the board wants to do that. And I don't mean that in any negative way. Of course, yeah, I can absolutely circulate uh, like a marked up 
version would track changes. And um, there's nothing about penalties that's proposed to change. Um, but I think it's important that you can see every specific change. So I can share that. Absolutely. Thank you. And you know what? It helps all of us when, you know, we go into these businesses and when the owners or customers, you know, have a particular question, you can say, well, we went through everything, we updated it, and that's why that option's available or, or not available. And then um, <clears throat> I don't really expect an answer on this, and I don't know if it's appropriate for this um, committee to discuss, but I read within the past two, three months, in the Boston Globe, it's on Wednesdays, they do their food sort of weekly informational piece. And there was one city or town that basically was um, working with longtime vacant um, storefront stores, especially around food services industry, where they sort of did like a work bar or shared use. Um, you know, like someone who said, geez, if I had a place that I could go cook this, but I can only do it two, three days. Um, so you may already be do, doing that, but I, I remember reading it and blanking on what city or town it was, but it looked really like something to look at. And then um, I don't expect an answer on this tonight, unless for some reason um, you've already seen the um, email, but I'm, I'm wondering, um, I don't know if it's from this rate, um, if you haven't, um, Beth Locke from the chamber sent two suggestions around APRA money funding <clears throat> for ideas that the chamber had. I don't know that you or Ms. Cotter were in on that email. Um, so I would ask that um, if I could ask the town manager, um, if you, you all haven't received it, if, you, if the manager could forward it to you both. And my question would be if one or both would be eligible to apply for CDBG funding. Um, I'm not saying, you know, just because they can apply means anybody necessarily gets it, but I don't want to make that, you know, or Adam may have already made that suggestion, Mr. Chaplain, um, but I, I remember thinking, I wonder if at least one of these could be considered by the committee, but I don't want to put anything before the committee that doesn't have, it, you know, it doesn't qualify. And that's it. Thank you. Thank you, Thank Mrs. Mahana. Uh, Mr. Diggins. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Yeah, Mr. Hurd made just a motion that I would have made, so I'm happy to support it. And um, Ms. Um, Carter, you shouldn't apologize for saying ACAC. -AC. You should apologize for not saying AC squared, because that's what all the cool kids are saying. All right, just let you know. And uh, so uh, just a couple of uh, quick questions. Uh, uh, so uh, were there no restaurant, no vacant restaurants in February 2000? No, there were. Um, the Papa Gino's has been vacant since November 2018. Yeah. Um, I like, I'm sorry. Go ahead, please. No, that's that's the the main one, but the rest uh, that got listed in here closed since the pandemic began. Yeah, I was just looking at the appendix, I mean, and so it didn't indicate any restaurant vacancies in 2020, in February 2020. So I was just wondering if if that meant there were none, I mean, or 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 if the, that information was just left out. Because uh, um, part of, part of that's, what that's leading to is so we've had other economic downturns caused by things other than pandemics, and so I me, mean, how do the closures that we're seeing I mean compared to other downturns? Hmm, that's an interesting thought question. Um, so I will say that between February 2020 and now, I've just gotten much more detailed. I I just always every time I do these vacancy reports try and drill down to another level of specificity so that's partly just like me getting more in depth over yeah. time with how I collect the data um I don't think there's anything really that compares to to this in terms of like to the pandemic in terms of like small business impacts um in huh recent history like not the 2008 bubble it that was like a whole different thing but i haven't researched that specifically much so right. I'll, I'll look into that more um right. no 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 I mean, well I mean, if you if you knew because i mean partly it was like yeah, I'm, I'm thinking if they were similar in, in 
in severity, although not cause, I mean, there might be some lessons learned I mean, um, from how we, you know, how we handled those. So that's the only reason for bringing it up. So, so, um, so that's it. I mean, and, and, and yeah, and, and I support um, um, this is behind the quest for the, the comparison because I was wanting that too when I was reading it. So it'd be really helpful. And, and yeah, let's update that code and get us in harmony with other municipalities. It'll be easier for everybody. So great. Thank you. Thanks, Len. Thank you, Mr. Diggins. And uh, yeah, I want to thank you, Ms. Carter, for the presentation and for uh, waiting so long to, to, to make it tonight. And I, I also support Mr. Hurd's uh, motion. Just a question on the Appendix B, where you have the, the, the streamline application. And one of the questions involves erecting a tent, and then there's a reference to a building permit. And I will say, I, I, I had been contacted by, a, a, or in a discussion, not really contacted, that I had with a business owner that um, referenced going through inspectional services for the tent. I don't know if there's any way to even streamline, streamline that process further for the individuals who wanna put a tent up. I think we're gonna see more demand for that type of thing um, or you know, as outdoor seating becomes more popular. And I don't know if that's a possibility because it does seem to, um, that that application process maybe needs to be updated given what's, um, what some business owners would like to do. And I don't know if you've got any feedback on that as you were talking to people about outdoor seating. Yeah, no, I have. I, I can speak with um, Mike Champa about that. It is tricky. Um, we have to uh, you know, go with whatever building code allows, but you know what I think we could do even if there's no, regulatory wiggle room is that with the outdoor dining license process we made like design guidelines with illustrations that were really nicely done that um kelly linema in our department put together um as only she can and um i think we could put similar guidelines for like you know things you need to keep in mind if you're setting up a tent um ada accessibility uh, things of that nature, weighing it down so that um, it doesn't fly away in any amount of wind. So even if there's nothing we can do rule-wise, I think we can work on um, design supports that get the business owners from A to B or A to Z, I guess, more quickly. Right, okay, good, no, th thank you. And I do, I also wanna comment on the park lot on Medford Street. That, that's a, that to me looks like a huge upgrade in terms of what that that seating looks like. So I think I think that's really great. And and any opportunity there is to upgrade existing areas or or change things as we go forward, making it more um, and wel welcoming for people to to look at. I certainly support that, even if it's duplicating funds that have already spent. If it's if it's upgrading it and it's going to attract more people to an area, I'm all for it. So I th I think that was a a really a, a, a big improvement. So so thank you for that. And and um, I also agree with Mrs. Mahan and Mr. Diggins and, and um, Mr. Hurd and I used to looking at red line versions of, of, of changes. So that's that that would be helpful. But clearly 2015, that's a long time between revisions. So um, we look forward to, to hearing you on that. So I, I think that does, I think, think we're prepared to, to, to vote on the motion for number two and, um, and then one and three, I think we'll we'll look to to hear from you again, or and then put you on a future agenda for that. Um, okay. So, and I, a motion by Mr. Hurd that was seconded by Mr. Helmuth, Attorney Heim. Mr. Hurd. It, sorry, Mr. Chair. If if it's cleaner, I can move receipt. I'll amend my motion to move receipt of one and three. Move approval of the recommendation. Perfect. That that that's I was that that that, that that's great. Thank thank you for that. And then Mr. Helmuth, that I, Mr. Helmuth just put thumbs up for the second. So why don't we do that? So it's approval of number two, receipt of one and three. Mr. Hurd. Yes. Mr. Diggins. Yes. Mr. Helmuth. Yes. Mrs. Mahan. Yes. Mr. DeCourcy. Yes. It's unanimous vote. Great. Thank, thank you, you so much. Okay, so this has been a night of skipping around on the agenda. And given that we've made uh, Mr. Amstutz wait for a while tonight, I, and Mr. Diggins is gonna be here no matter what, um, I'd like to, to move on to number 13 and then we'll go back to 12. Um, item 13 is a discussion and approval of a Blue Bank station relocation. 
uh, for the railroad lot, Daniel Anstutz, Senior Transportation Planner. Good evening, Mr. Anstutz. Good evening. Thank you for sticking with us and uh, for your patience and the full, uh, go right ahead in, in describing what the, um, the, the, the approvals you're looking for this evening. Uh, thank you, yes, I'll try to keep this uh, very quick. Um, so I sent in with the materials, uh, so a memo describing the situation and then also uh, some images and pictures, which I help, uh, I, I think helps to describe it a bit. So essentially um, we have a blue bikes program in Arlington. We have six stations total right now and five of them are on street, uh, which means they're taking up some parking spaces on street mainly. Uh, we have one station that's off street that's at Magnolia Field right off the bikeway. Um, and what we're trying to do is to get more of the stations that we have off street. Um, during the winter, they need to be picked up for uh, and put into winter storage, the blue bike stations, um, mainly so that they don't get hit by plows that are plowing snow. Um, generally, the, you know, ridership does decline in the winter. Um, but having the stations open uh, year round, which is what getting the stations off street will help us do. Uh, we'll keep our, you know, <clears throat> keep providing this uh, transportation option to people year round. Uh, people, you know, still will bike in the winter and we'll use them. Um, most, uh, many other communities that are within the Blue Bikes uh, system do have many um, stations that are uh, operational year round. So essentially the two that were talking about is is one that is already approved through the Parks and Rec uh, Commission and the Recreation Department, which is at Linwood Street. This is more of a four-year information, but that would be moved off street, uh, literally about 20 feet um, behind the sidewalk over at Scannell Field. So that'll open up a couple of spaces on Linwood Street and again, provide that um, year-round uh, ability for that to function. And so there is already a sort of sidewalk that's sort of built behind the sidewalk that Public Works has done uh, a couple of weeks ago and Blue Bike staff can move that there, um, you know, as soon as maybe weather gets better. Uh, the other one that, that I'm actually looking for approval for tonight is along um, of the railroad lot, which is sort of the westernmost Blue Bike station that we have. And, and both of these stations, Linwood and Railroad lot are the most, uh, the busiest stations that we have that are, that are the most productive. And the idea with the um, one of the railroad lot is to move it onto some existing sidewalk. So it doesn't require some existing infrastructure right now. And the there's a wide sidewalk section, a brick sidewalk that's adjacent to the building at 631 to 644 Mass Ave. I believe that's the number. And so Working with uh, Blue Bike staff, they've confirmed that there's enough space for the station to kind of orient so that the bikes are, you pull them out towards the building. Um, that'll still provide enough space. Uh, it's about 10 feet or 11 feet wide. So there'll be enough space for somebody to walk by. So provide ADA access there. Um, there is sort of an alternative route if you kind of go around this small triangle of, of grass, which has some bike racks. Um, so that would still be uh, available, but the idea is to, to move it, um, the station onto the sidewalk so that it can operate year round. Um, and uh, I have contacted the uh, businesses that are within that building, or at least as many as I know of, the Coldwell Banker, the Goslin Law, um, the, the Susan Stamps Law Office. We also sent a letter to the abutter uh, or the property owner of that building. Um, I haven't heard back from any of them. I don't know if any of them are here today, uh, but generally speaking, I, I think the only impact would be on snow clearance, which the Blue Bike staff will do if the snow is six inches or higher. Uh, it's essentially, it's plowable um, that they uh, are committed to, you know, shoveling out those stations, I think within 24 hours of the snow fall uh, finishing up. So um, let me just, see if I had anything else. Um, this will save the town money because to put the stations into winter storage does cost us something. So save about $5,000 per year. Um, as I mentioned, these are the most productive stations and we'll free up some parking spaces. So I think it's, it's really a good benefit all around. And uh, we'll work on 
uh, figuring out ways to get the other uh, three stations that are on street to off street locations as well so that they can also function year round. So I'm happy to take any questions. Thank you, Mr. Amstutz. Uh, I'll start with Mr. Helmuth. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, thank you, Mr. Amstutz. And uh, as, as it happens, I had the privilege of attending a, a noontime webinar today about um, sustainable bike and bus infrastructure in, in the region and blue bikes were on the menu. Uh, we heard from blue bikes and I learned a couple of interesting tidbits, one of which is that uh, they do find that people ride in the winter more than, than you'd think. Um, and that people are deterred more by precipitation than temperatures. And you know, if, if municipalities are doing things like plowing um, bikeways and, and things like that and shoving up the stations that they will use it. So I think that's great. Um, I also learned that the, that the blue bikes re, on a regional basis move um, nearly as much people as the MBTA Silver Line did last year. So that is pretty cool. Um, you know, these, it, that really got my attention that, that, you know, this is a viable way to move people in a sustainable way and a, and a way that promotes health. Um, so this is a good move. I appreciate the work to, um, to make them even better and more accessible to residents. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Helmuth. Uh, Mr. Diggins. Thank you, Mr. Chair. So Dan, Mr. Anstrup, I'm sorry. Uh, <laughs> these, are, these, these meetings are longer than MPO meetings, huh? Who would have thunk it? I could go on and on, but I'm not. I mean, good report, I mean, and I'm, I'm happy to second it on uh, Mr. Helmet's um, motion. Did I move it? No. So I'll take your second, Mr. Diggins, but Mr. Helmet, if you want yes, to make the motion. Sorry about that. It's late. Uh, move approval. Great. Thank you. Um, and thank you, Mr. Diggins. Uh, Mr. Hurd. Thank you. Happy to support this. I get the opportunity to walk by the blue bike station in the center every day. And I'm actually amazed there never seems to be any bikes on there. So I, it, clearly Arlington residents are using the blue bikes and uh, it's a huge asset to the town and the residents. Um, and I'm happy to see, although it's not in our approval, the movement of the station at Scanna. We had a game there on Saturday I had to park like three miles away from the field because parking's tough in that area. So I, I, I was happy to see the new fresh pad that was poured there. And I think at, um, in the center, in the real road lot, it will certainly be beneficial to the town to have those centrally, lo centrally located bikes there all year as well. So thank you. Thank you, Mr. Hurd. Um, Mrs. Mahan. Thank you, Mr. Chair. And I don't know how Mr. Amstutz does everything that he does for so many of our uh, town committees, uh, select board sort of directives, um, clean energy, energy um, and you always do a very, very diligent job um, and pretty much give me nothing to really talk about because you provide all the information. Um, so I definitely will support this and. Um, and it's probably safe to say you're going to find a place for those other two sites. And what I look forward to see you in the future, hopefully earlier in the evening. <laughs> okay, thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Mrs. Mahan. And yeah, and I, I'll, I'll support the motion as well. Just one quick question, Ms. Dams, that's at, at the railroad lot. Is there anything that needs to be done to prepare the area for the, for the blue bike station? We'll just go on the existing sidewalk there. Not to my understanding, I, there is, um, I did ask for confirmation from the Blue Bike staff that these locations will work and they will, um, you know, they did go out in the field and take a look at them. I had originally considered, um, I think before, before putting it in the lot itself, um, the sort of, there's another side of the sort of brick sidewalk that sort of faces towards the bikeway on the other side of this little um, grass triangle. And I noticed that there's a significant bump in the brick sidewalk, I think from a tree that was a tree root perhaps that was uh, taken out at some point. Um, so this seemed to be fairly, um, fairly flat and uh, as brick sidewalks go. So uh, I didn't, didn't get anything from Blue Bike staff that said that we needed to do anything more. 
Okay. All right. And, and I, I'm glad to hear that. I mean, I, I support getting the station off of the lot and, and in the case of Linwood off of the street. I'm a little concerned about how close it is to the building. And I'm, I, I'm wondering if you're not going to get feedback once it's it's moved. But if there's nothing that you need to do to prepare the area and construct or anything, if there's a problem, it can be moved. So I'm, I'm, I'm happy to go along with it on that basis. But that does feels a little close. And, and I don't know if there's another alternative. I do want to second what Mr. Hurd said on Linwood. I think when you first came in before us, um, he, there was a hope to get some of the stations off the street. And I think that's a perfect movement because cars want to park there. There's room and there's still plenty of room between the blue bike station and, and the little league field. So, um, okay, with that, I will uh, thank you for waiting next time, Mr. Chaplain, Mr. Amstutz gets on early next time he comes in. So we'll, we'll put him on for an early presentation the next time he's before us. Um, on a motion by Mr. Helmuth that was seconded by Mr. Diggins, Attorney Hein. Mr. Hurd? Yes. Mr. Diggins? Yes. Mr. Helmuth? Yes. Mrs. Mahan? Yes, thank you. Mr. DeCourcy? Yes. Great. Thank you, Mr. Thank you, very, thank you very much. Okay, so uh, we will now go back to number 12, a discussion and vote, a letter in support of Bill Senate 868 or and House 1377, an act empowering cities and towns to impose a fee on certain real estate transactions to support affordable housing. Uh, Mr. Diggins. Thank you, Mr. Chair. I mean, so um, for the, about the last year or so, I've been working with the Real Estate, real estate Transfer Fee Coalition you know, um, headed by uh, the folks in Somerville. You know, but it's a, it's a large um, number of municipalities you know, involved in this. You know, and initially when I started, uh, Aaron Zirko uh, was part of it uh, and, and actually uh, joined it because Pam Hallett didn't have the bandwidth. And, and I figured it would be a good way for me to learn more about housing I mean, and, and um, get connected with some of the people in the region who are working on it. It's a really good coalition. And um, um, our, our, um, um, our Senator, Senator Friedman, uh, uh, knows the, the sponsor of it, um, Senator Comerford, uh, very well. I mean, and so she uh, strongly supports it. And so does um, Representative Gar Garberly I mean, and Representative Rogers. Uh, so we all know how these letters work. I mean, and you have to do the work long before you send in the letter. And, and the coalition has really done the work. And, uh, but the coalition also wants letters, being especially from um, entities such as select boards. Mean. And so uh, I can't tell you the other select boards that are sending letters just because I can't remember them right now. Uh, uh, but I think it would be good for us to uh, be a part of that, mean to show solidarity with the other uh, select boards, especially since we unanimously even though Eric wasn't part of it, he would have unanimously supported this, uh, the real estate transfer fee um, home rule petition. Uh, and, and so, so uh, I don't think it's a stretch to ask this board to, to sign uh, on for, for a letter such as this, unless it's just a policy of the board not to do something like that, in which case that's fine um, with me. I just needed to make the attempt. Uh, and, and certainly, um, if you are inclined to support it and you see any formatting or wording that you would like change, I'm happy uh, to do that. This is my first one of these, Vita, and, and I think we have until Wednesday or so to safely get it in. So uh, that's it. Any questions? I'm happy to answer. Okay, great, great, Mr. Diggins. And, and I, before I turn it over to other members, I just want to um, add uh, to just, just one point. And what, what these two bills do is they create local options. So at that uh, city of towns option, they could create the real estate tax transfer fee. What we tried to do last year at town meeting is go through the home rule petition process where we're basically asking for the legislature's approval for Arlington to create the real estate transfer tax fee. I think in the, the, the delegation, I'm sure would say this way has a much greater chance of, of passing because it applies to any community that wants to accept it as at, at their option, as opposed to the two or three communities that are looking to come in. And as it says in the draft letter that uh, Mr. Diggins prepared, um, the three members of our delegation are co-sponsors on, on the House side, 
uh, Representative Garbelli and Representative Rogers are co-sponsors and Senator Friedman is a co-sponsor on the Senate side. Um, so with that, I will um, turn to Mr. Helmuth. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, you're right, Mr. Diggins. I would have wholeheartedly uh, supported this. I certainly did in town meeting on that in that vote. Uh, thank you for your work in the coalition. I didn't know you were doing this until I read the, the letter and that's outstanding. I wouldn't change a word of the letter. I thought it was clear and perfectly argued and makes sense to me. Um, so I am very happy to support it. And I, you know, and I agree. I think that you know, having, having this statewide opportunity for this and to give the municipalities the discretion, it, it would still let municipalities make the best choice, but to give them the opportunity makes a whole lot of sense. Um, so, uh, so thanks for the work. And uh, I move approval. Great, thank you, Mr. Helmuth. Uh, Mrs. Mahan. Thank you, Mr. Chair. I'll second that. And um, thanks to, um, to Mr. Diggins for not only taking the initiative, but doing the background legwork um, to try to find the best possible vehicle or way to have, hopefully have, as the chair stated, a, a better success rate of um, getting this through. So thank you, Mr. Chair. Thank you, Mrs. Mahan. Mr. Hurd. Happy to support this. Thank you, Mr. Diggins, for taking the time to draft the letter. And my brevity is due to time, not enthusiasm for the cause. So thank you. Thank, thank, thank you, Mr. Hurd. And thank you, Mr. Diggins. You, you contacted me about this and put this together in a very short period of time. And I think it makes good sense. Just a question for you as intended. Do you, are you looking for a, all of our signatures are on this. Sometimes we'll do it the full board. Sometimes it will be a vote to authorize the chair to sign on behalf of the board. I'm happy either way. I mean, I don't know if it was suggested to you if it should be every member. I think it'll be fine. I mean, just just with you signing it, you know. So, so I, mean, I mean, I guess they could. We could do all five, but I think it's Arlington Select Board is going to be plenty good I mean, so if that's easier let's just go with that I mean, and and i'll add a, a couple other things one is that there have been i think about nine at least nine communities that have done the, the home rule petition and none of them have gone through uh concord has done it multiple times I mean, and so it's getting hung up in the legislature it's not really clear why and it, this the support will be meaningful uh because there are some other bills in mean, uh uh, and they're not as good I mean, with respect to what the real estate transfer fee can raise for for um, affordable housing. So, and the government may ha governor may have his own ideas. And so, so the deal is that we just want to get more support for real estate transfer fees because it may have to get included in something else. And so, we want to make it clear I mean, to folks that this has a lot of support. Thank you. Okay, thank, thank you, Mr. Diggins. Mr. Helmuth, if it's all right with you then, based on what Mr. Diggins said, if you wouldn't mind amending your motion to authorize the chair to sign the letter on behalf of the board. Yeah, that's okay. fine, Mr. Chair. And I think, you know, the, your discretion, you could, you could certainly mention that there's a, you know, a vote, a positive vote, if, if sure. that's what happens, um, you know, to, to indicate that it does represent all of us. Okay, yeah. good, thank you. Um, okay, so on a, a motion by Mr. Helmuth and um, seconded by Mrs. Mahan, Attorney Heim. Mr. Hurd? Yes. Mr. Diggins? Yes. Mr. Helmuth? Yes. Mrs. Mahan? Yes. Mr. DeCourcy? Yes. It's unanimous vote. Okay. Um, that does it for number 13, correspondence received, items 14 and 15. Um, item 14, change of pickup drop off location at Stratton School, and item 15, safety issues on Elmhurst Road. Uh, Mrs. Mahan? Like to move receipt and um, on uh, uh, number fourteen, I guess um, ha uh, have the chair and the select board office continue um, conversation um, with the town manager. Um, the next steps, and I, I guess the same motion, move receipt and refer to the chair and the town manager on the Elmhurst Road. Okay, uh, thank thank you, Mr. Chaplin. Did you want to add anything to that or? Yes. You can't go up. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I think Mrs. Mahan's recommendation for receipt and referral make very good sense. But on number 14, I just wanted to mention that I've been in communication with Dr. Holman about that matter. And as I think uh, the board can see, basically, they're, they're trying to solve a conflict between 
parents dropping off parked cars and the bus that drops off and then brings students from the Stratton School down to the Gibbs School. They're going to pilot some on-street parking restrictions before coming to the board to request potential permanent parking restrictions. So I think tonight was really a heads up that they're working on solutions with the likelihood that they'll be back before the board to make a request in the near future. Okay, thank you. Uh, Mr. Hurd. Second. Mr. Diggins. Um, I, 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 no comment, I approve. Okay, and, and Mr. Helmut. No comments, thank you. Great, and I support it as well as as, as moved. Um, so on a motion by Mrs. Mahan, seconded by Mr. Hurd, Attorney Hyde. Mr. Hurd? Yes. Mr. Diggins? Yes. Mr. Helmut? Yes. Mrs. Mahan? Yes. Mr. Ch uh, DeCourcy? Yes. Okay. New business, Attorney Heim. No, no business. Mr. Chapterline. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, with the board's indulgence, uh, I learned today via conversation with town council that the town is gonna be able to apply for a grant uh, in relation to water sewer investments that we will likely get $48,000, which will help us pay down sewer related debt service. The applications due Friday and we learned today that as the water sewer commissioners, the board needs to vote affirmatively and sign on to that application. So I wanted to ask the board if we could possibly schedule um, a very quick meeting on Thursday, potentially in the morning to do five minutes on that matter, uh, approve moving forward the grant application and, and you know hopefully be done with it very quickly. Yeah. is is. So, I mean, we're new business here, but I, I, I think Mr. Chapdelin had raised that to me and given what's at stake here, we couldn't put it on for tonight, but it is a grant that we could have. Um, I would need to notice a meeting tomorrow for Thursday. And if the morning isn't good, we could do it a little later in the day. I know it gets tight as to when things are done, but um, what I, how about if I do this? Um, why don't I notice a meeting on Thursday before I do it, I'll do it during the day. If there's any concerns that people have on particular times during the day, we'll try to address that. Okay. Is, is, is Thursday out for anybody? Is, is, that, is that a problem? Okay, all right. So why don't we do that and we can do it through the board office in terms of getting the time that people people are available. I think that's that that probably makes the most sense. Okay, thank you, Mr. Chapdelaine. Thank you. Uh, anything that. else? That's all I have, thank you. Okay, uh, Mr. Helmuth. No new business. Mr. Diggins. Thanks to Mr. Heim. We're having a work primer and workshop on warrant articles. It's going to be uh, hosted by the Civic Engagement Group. It's going to be virtual, of course, being on Thursday, November 4th, 7 o'clock to 8.30 p.m. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Diggins. Mr. Hurd. I just do, again, want to briefly thank um, former Chief Jefferson and Rob Dustin for a really incredible event on uh, Friday for the six retiring firefighters and wish them all well in their reti well-deserved retirement. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Hurd. Mrs. Mahan. Um, th thank you, Mr. Chair. On the Thursday meeting, um, uh, ideally for me early in the morning um, when John's still home, but if that doesn't work and it's truly a um, one agenda item, um, I, I'm really not available until like, um, let's see, she gets her meds at two, <clears throat> like, um, three, because okay. if I do anything during, before her last medicines, you, you know, you know what I'm talking about, Mr. Corsi, yeah. if I did do her at 132. So is there any way we can okay. do early morning Thursday or any time between after three PM? Okay. And two quick new business. Um, one, I was going to uh, begun discussions. I've had discussions with the town manager for the past two and a half plus years at Ms. Rowe. Um, but now um, what I want to do is talk to the chair tomorrow um, and then about a strategy from UGAR. If it's something, because it's, it will be in the initial phases of possibly doing this to present as an option, if it would could be covered by executive session 
Um, and then if we do take the step, then it would be on public. So I'm gonna have that conversation with the chair tomorrow. Um, and um, Mr. Chapdelaine is still taking my calls. And then the other thing I'd leave it up to the chair in terms of um, a report update on long range planning committee. Um, I believe the full board received a, a, an email from um, Charlie Foskett as an individual, um, not representing the full FinCom or long range. Um, if you didn't get it where he was talking about the impending override um, and puts out some suggestions just sort of as a ma matrix. Um, if you didn't get it, just um, let the office know. And um, I know I cc them a copy of the letter. And that's it, Mr. Mr. Chairman, thank you. Okay, thank you, Mrs. Mahan. And um, so just, just briefly on, on the MUGAR point, I did speak to, to the town manager. We've been speaking regularly about it. And I think there will be something, uh, I can talk to you about that tomorrow as well um that we will put on a future agenda and 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 you're absolutely right it, it's possible that it could be an executive session type item or um depending on on the, on the nature of things so we will um address that and the other thing i wanted to say was um just wanted to, to echo what mr hurd said about the um the, the, the retirement uh dinner that, that that we attended on friday so uh with that um we have an executive session item um, on now. So um, the executive session will be to conduct a strategy session in preparation for contract negotiations with non-union personnel, the town manager, and or conduct contract negotiations with same. Um, if I could have a motion for that, and then we may address timing once we're once we're in in in, in the session. Motion to go into executive session. Anybody care to make it? I'll make it motion to go into executive um, session. And this time, let's just please I mean, um, adjourn out, out of that session. Yeah. Okay, is there a second? Second. Okay, motion has been made by Mr. Diggins, seconded by Mr. Helmuth, Attorney Hyde. Sure. Yes. Ms. Diggins? Yes. Mr. Helmuth? Yes. Mrs. Mahan? Yes. Mr. DeCourcy. Yes. Okay. Thank so you. you know, so we, I'm sorry, Mr. You. DeCourcy, just to be clear, we will not return from executive session. Is that that's correct? My understanding? Okay. That's correct. Yeah. So that will be it for the public portion of the meeting. We will be going into executive session and adjourning. Um, thank you everyone for staying with us. And uh, that, that concludes this, the public portion of the meeting tonight.